All right, any questions before we get rolling today? All right, then let's talk about the game plan. We have it all here laid out in front of us, what's gonna be happening for really the next week and change. Uh, today, uh, we are going to uh, continue our discussion of uh, the cell. Uh, once again, starting first with anatomy, where we're gonna focus on the anatomy of the plasma membrane. And then from there, we are gonna go on to the physiology, where we talk about membrane transport. So that's what we're doing for both our lab and lecture today. Uh, next week, um, we still have a lot of information, a lot of material, not quite as many activities are due, uh, but it's still a lot of material that we're going to be covering. And next week, when we, like I said, when we get into the tissues, we get to the skin, that tends to be some of the more dense things, some of the more challenging things. So again, I want to strongly encourage you this weekend to start looking ahead at that material. Uh, start looking at the tissues because I think that's the part that people really struggle with. You know, most people know what the femoral region of the body is or the brachial region of the body or what superior or inferior mean. Uh, but things like a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium are things people have never seen before. So it is important to start familiarizing yourself with these things because the more familiar you are with it, the easier that test is going to be. Uh, next week, uh, on Monday, you have two assignments that are due. Your Unit 4 review is going to be due. That's the one on cells. And then also your Membrane Transport Labster is due. Also on Monday, after the lecture, we will be doing a practice lab exam. So we're not going to do it at the beginning of class. We'll do it after the lecture. Uh, do take, you will then take you know, 20 minutes to take the quiz, uh, the, the uh, exam, and then we'll talk about it after that. Again, this is not for any points. This is just for you to get an opportunity to see what these types of questions are going to be like and to be able to uh, then we can talk about it so you can be prepared for the real exam when we get there. Uh, yes, quick question about the physio X. What is that? Okay, great question. Uh, so let's do that. Hold on. I have to switch gears because that's the next thing we have to talk about. So again, I don't have a student version of the modified of the mastering AP, the modified mastering AP. So let me cheat by getting here. All right. So I don't know what your home page looks like, but when you get into your master in A&P, you're going to go to your study area. Um, and no, there is no daily quiz today, as I mentioned. Um, when you launch the study area, this is where, again, you're going to spend probably the most of your time in mastering in A&P. Uh, this is where you have uh, access. This is one of the places where you can get to the electronic version of the textbook. This is where there's all sorts of practice tests and quizzes where you can take lots of practice, um, uh, multiple choice questions, get used to answering those kind of things. You can actually separate things by chapter and look and find the material that there. And there are a lot, a ton of great resources. When we get to the bones and the muscles, the, pra uh, the practice anatomy lab is something that is going to be super important for you to be able to take advantage of. There's a flashcard maker for it. If you want to have that, you can actually download these flashcards to your phone and use it like an app. Uh, the interactive physiology, which is a great tutorial, a visual tutorial to walk you through this information. Uh, but uh, for the, this is also where you will come for the Physio X. So here is where you will go to get to the Physio X. Uh, when you get to the Physio X, you are going to do the exercises. So you're going to click on that. And that brings you here. And again, here is the assignment that is going to be due, the first five activities. Remember, as we talked about, when you go through all of these activities, you're going to go step by step through each step of it, answering the questions, doing all of the things. And clearly, I'm not. Uh, and again, as you do it, you submit. Then you do the activities and go through all of those, collect your data, record your data, follow the directions. It's very straightforward. It tells you exactly what to do, right? Step one, grab the 20 molecular weight cutoff a membrane, bang, you put it in between. After you do all those things, at the very end, there is a lab report. 
And so again, obviously I didn't do anything, there is no data here, but you will have a large lab report when that is done. You are gonna click the button, you'll have to scroll down all the way to the bottom to the printable version. When you go to the printable version, you put in your name, and when you click print, instead of printing it as paper, uh, you're just gonna select save it as a PDF. You have that option of saving it as a PDF. And then that PDF is what you drop off in the module on that assignment. So that's what you're gonna do with that. Remember, there are five different PhysioX activities, so you're gonna end up five different lab reports uh, that you're going to be doing on this. So make sure you get all five of your lab reports and submit all five of those online. And you did right. say that, uh, you did say, make sure you do, you click on print after each section, don't wait until the end, because then it's, gonna, it's not gonna print all of them, it's just gonna print the last one, correct? Correct. So if we actually go, uh, well, actually, hold on, I don't know if I can even go back. Um, well, yes, what happens is as you finish activity one, once you get to the end of it, to the lab report, right, you do have the opportunity to move on to the next exercise, right? Or you could, or you might want to go to the next exercise or go back and do it, or you can reset the activity. Uh, make sure you print it because it doesn't save it. So if you step away from this page and then come back, then it will be gone. You'll have to do it again. So make sure you save all your lab reports, print all your lab reports as you go through them. And is this also like the, if you complete 80%, you get full credit or no? Uh, the, the, again, the 80% is something that is for Labster. Again, this is a homework assignment in that I expect it to be a learning activity for you. So yes, you are not, you do not lose points for getting things wrong. If you leave things blank and do not complete them, uh, then that is when you're gonna lose points. So if you're not putting time and effort into it, if you're not doing, uh, answering the questions, then then yes, if so it's, I'm looking for time and effort. You don't lose points for getting it wrong. All right? Okay. We haven't hit any assignment yet where you're gonna lose points for getting it wrong, we will. Uh, and uh, not Thursday, no, the Physio X is actually due Tuesday. So to answer that question. So Physio X is due on Tuesday. So the Labster, the next Labster, is it? Uh, the video's are already posted. So uh, they should all be on there on there right now. Okay, so yeah, I posted the other one last night. So I think it should be there now. I think I saw it there. All right, uh, hold on, I think there was one other question. All righty, great questions. All right, any others? All right, well then let's go through the rest of the things. So yes, yeah, so Monday again, in unit four review, the Labster, and we'll be doing that practice lab exam again. No points on it, it is just a chance for you to see what a lab exam is gonna be like uh, and to challenge yourself to see how you've been studying the material to see if you're prepared or not. Uh, Tuesday, the Physio X exercise one is due. And again, remember there are five activities. So that's five lab reports that you are turning in. Thursday, your unit five review is due. And there's also a really interesting biointeractive uh, lab that we found. Well, I didn't find, uh, someone else found and uh, I'm using it. Uh, it has a handout that you're going to download and complete as you watch the activity and, uh, and follow the activity along and fill that in. And so that handout is due on Thursday as well. Uh, and again, all of these resources, the PhysioX, the Buyer Interactive, the Labster, all of those are available uh, all the time. So you can be doing them, however. Uh, Friday, your Unit 6 review is going to be due. The other thing that is going to be due, and this kind of feeds back to what we were talking about earlier, is as we start getting to the tissues, as we start getting to the integumentary system, the bones, other areas, like I said, there are some lab uh, study guides that are lab, the lab handouts that are kind of like study guides to help you to prepare for that material. Uh, we mentioned this a little bit in the last class, how on these, there are two handouts there, an epithelial tissue and a connective tissue handout. They are a precise list of the exact tissues you're going to be responsible for, the material you're responsible for on those tissues. And as I mentioned, if you look at that, in parentheses next to each term is the actual keyword that I will use so that you know if I'm asking you to identify a space or if I'm asking you to identify an organelle or if I'm asking you to identify a layer, you know exactly the keyword that I will be doing for that. 
now because I appreciate how challenging uh, histology can be for students. Uh, this study guide actually has spaces on them where you are going to draw these tissues. So these are handouts you will have to print out. Uh, I expect you to draw the tissues on there. We will do a little of it together next week. I'll show you exactly what it is that I want from you and what it is that we're looking for and how you're gonna wanna complete this. Uh, but this is going to be, you're gonna be basically making your own study guide. You are not getting graded on your drawing skills. You've seen my drawing skills. Clearly I'm not grading anybody on how well they draw. Um, but I do want you to put something in that circle that makes sense to you and you're going to label it. So basically you'll be making a study guide. So it's a way to strongly encourage you to be uh, looking at and doing these tissues. And so that assignment uh, is going so that once you print them out, once you write uh, draw the drawings, label the drawings. You will take pictures of them and submit those or scan them, I guess, if you have the capability of doing that. You'll either scan or take pictures of them and then you will submit those and those are due on Friday as well. And so that way you'll have a great study guide that'll help you to be successful on the exam, which is the following Monday. And that's it, that's our game plan. All right, questions on that? Obviously, we'll talk more about the tissues and the other stuff as we move into next week. But again, I always like you to have a good idea of what's coming up and what's expected of you, especially because we really only have two. Again, if you think about it, we only have two weekends before the next exam. And if you really think about it, you only have five days off between now and the next exam. You have this weekend, next weekend, and Wednesday. And that's it. So it's going to be busy. There's a lot of material to cover. Four days of lectures, five if you conclude day. So five days of lectures, five days off, and then we have a so it's pretty nuts. All right, questions on any of that? All right, excellent. From there then, let's go ahead and switch to the lecture then. If there are no more questions. Perfect. All right, so as I mentioned, our goal now is going to be to continue our discussion of the tissues, uh, pardon me, of the cells, uh, and talking in particular about the plasma membrane. Now, let's, we can go ahead and, uh, I don't wanna do this. Um, you know what, let's cheat. Go back here. So, we've talked about the plasma membrane when we think of the cell, we have that cell, and normally when we draw the cell, we just draw it as a big circle, and that is just that red line. But as we know, there's a whole lot going on with that plasma membrane. What is the primary component of the plasma membrane? What is the primary macromolecule that forms the plasma membrane again? Phospholipids. Phospholipids, excellent, right? And as we know, phospholipids basically have two components to them. They have a polar head region, and then they have those two fatty acid tails. And how are these phospholipids arranged again? Bilayer. In a bilayer, excellent. Right, where we have the two polar heads facing away from each other and the fatty acid tails pointing inward. The advantage of this is that the polar head can uh, react with water, and things that are in the water outside of the cell, right? This is the outside of the cell up here. A question? Yep. Uh, what are the heads made out of? Is it water material or is it uh, a lipid? It's a lipid material, but it is a pole. Well, again, the whole thing is lipid. The head is a polar molecule, meaning that uh, while it is a portion of the, uh, of the lipid, it does have polar components to it that allow it to interact with, uh, and, uh, and with water and the things that are dissolved in the water. Okay. So, and this is the water, do O, uh, O inside the cell. Excellent. And we know we have a whole string of them. So again, it's going to take me time to draw these, but I just need to draw at least a couple more because that's going to help us to understand the next concept of this. One of the important things to remember, I'm going to cheat and move this one back over a little bit, is that these phospholipids uh, are dynamic. Think of it this way. If 
you have a glass of water and you take that glass of water and you pour a little bit of olive oil very carefully and very slowly onto the top. What happens to that olive oil? It rises. Yeah, it's gonna stay on the top and you'll get a pool of it on the top. Now, if you think about that pool of, of lipid, that pool of oil on the top of the water, is every single one of those oil molecules just finding a location and just sitting there and not moving at all? I kind of always imagine it. I, I think of back when my, uh, my daughter was in kindergarten. My daughter was in kindergarten. Anytime they ever got up to do any type of physical activity, like a dance or something in kindergarten, all the kids would put their arms out and swing them around so that they wouldn't hit anybody else. So basically allowed the kids to spread out in the classroom. Everybody found their spot and then they just stayed there. Right? Is that what the oil, the oil molecules do? They just all find their spot and they just sit there happily? No. Is that what happens? No. No. These things are dynamically moving around. And the same thing is true for these phospholipids. These phospholipids, hold on, my chat window closed. Yeah, it, it, perfect. That, exactly. It, it is fluid. In fact, not only is it fluid, but we have a very special term for it. We call it a fluid mosaic. It is a fluid mosaic. What that means is that these phospholipids can actually change positions with each other. So these two may switch positions or these two may switch positions. And in fact, they may uh, a phospholipid may change positions with another phospholipid. Uh, let's use a totally unrealistic uh, uh, number, uh, like once every second. Now, do you think that, uh, uh, pardon me, do you think these phospholipids can change from one layer to another? Whereas these two can change positions, do you think these two could change positions? No. Well, it turns out they can, but you're on, you, you are on the, right, uh, on the right path. It is much, much harder to change positions this way. So for instance, as I said, for argument's sake, if these change position once every second, then maybe this change positions once every week or something like that. So it's much less common, but these fluid, uh, these, um, these lipids do move around. They do have some fluidity to them. They're this fluid mosaic. And that is important for giving the cell some flexibility, giving the cell uh, some, uh, some, some, some dynamics in its ability to move. However, here's the problem with that. If it's too fluid, then it's not going to form an effective barrier the same way that we talked about it needing to be a barrier to help to separate the outside of the cell from the inside of the cell. So as it turns out, the phospholipids are not the only lipids that are found in a plasma membrane. If you remember, we talked about our friend cholesterol. Now remember, cholesterol is made up of four carbon rings. I'm not gonna even attempt to try to draw that, so I'm just gonna cheat and draw it as a box. But remember, it was four carbon rings put together uh, that had that functional group coming off of it. That cholesterol, remember we talked about being important, and one of the ways that cholesterol is important is it embeds itself within the regions here of the tails of our phospholipid. It is a hydrophobic lipid like the, fast, like the fatty acid tails, and so it embeds itself within this space. And so now if we think of numbering these, this is one, this is two, this is three, with that cholesterol there, which of these are more likely to change positions? And one and two more likely to change positions or two and three more likely to change positions? One and two. One and two, exactly. So by putting these, by embedding these cholesterols into our fatty acid tail region, uh, it adds more structure and more integrity to our plasma membrane. So yes, our plasma membrane is primarily made up of phospholipids. That is the primary uh, macromolecule, the primary component, but other lipids play a role in helping to form structure and integrity to it as well. Question. Yes. Um, what's the reason for the heads from the outer layer and the inner layer to to swap positions, so what would be a, the reason for that? Well, uh, again, it provides flexibility to the plasma membrane, not making it rigid, right? If you think about it, one of the problems with rigidity is that it can become fragile and more easily broken, 
So there's constant movement in fluid and constant movement in pressures. And so it makes it much, much more resilient to dynamic changes that are taking place. Oh, okay. So it moves pretty much without any reasoning, just, just because of the movement, like they, daily movement, correct? Yeah, it, it, it allows it to be more dynamic. That is correct. Uh, was That's there another question? Ryan, did you have a question? I thought I saw someone else raise their hand. Yeah, yeah. Um, so does that mean the proteins embedded in the membrane uh, or the receptors, they move around as well? Absolutely. They, they, they do two things. They do move around, but like the cholesterol, they also add more structure to it as well. Okay. And you've hit on a very good point. So you're absolutely correct. So oh, we oops. have talked. Yeah. <laughs> I just raised my hand again on accident. Oh, okay. I was trying to put it away. No worries. So yeah, absolutely. And then, so perfect. So those are the lipids, but you've hit on a key component uh, that lipids are not the only thing we find in the plasma membrane. They are a big component of it, but they aren't the, other com the only component of it. Now we'll talk about proteins in just a second, but before we get to proteins, let's talk about a different uh, macromolecule. And that different macromolecule is going to be um, carbohydrates. Our sugars, oh, and let's change that to orange now. Perfect. Carbohydrates, remember, are those uh, five or six carbon rings. And again, I'm not going to be able to draw uh, the hexagons or the pentagons for those, so I'll just cheat and draw them as circles. We can have large lines of glycogen on the surface that can be attached to the lipids or they can just be embedded within here by themselves in between and have these structures coming out. But we can have these carbohydrates on their surface. Now, why might we wanna put carbohydrates on the surface? Notice I've put them both on the outer surface. They can be on the inner surface, but they are more common on the outer surface. Is it a protection? Well, are carbohydrates necessarily going to provide a lot of protection? They might provide some protection. Again, it's going to provide some structure and integrity. What else might be a reason why we put stuff on the outer surface of the cell? Interact with something. I don't know. One of them is definitely to interact with something. Again, let's start the easy things, right? What happens to your hand when you get sugar all over the surface of it? Sticky. Sticky. It gets sticky, exactly. Uh, in fact, many of these carbohydrates are what are known as a glycocalyx. That glycocalyx is, actually means sugar coat. And its job is to make the cell sticky, helping to hold it together in the tissue or to anchor it in space within the tissue to provide things that way. The other reason you might want to have things like these carbohydrates, and proteins will play the same role, we'll talk about those in just a second, can play the same role, is also to act as a label. One of the important things for us to be able to do is tell the difference between our cells and things that are not our cells. Right? Again, back in ancient times, uh, we used to be able to travel, right? and the weekend coming up would be a perfect time to go down to Disneyland for a couple days. All right, so you hop on the plane. And again, because, and again, back in ancient times, planes used to be packed. You would have your black rolling uh, cart, your back, black rolling bag, and there would be no room for it in the overhead, so they would check it for you. And so you'd get to your destination, and when you got there, you'd be sitting at the luggage carousel and looking for a black rolling bag that comes out. And what's the problem? Well, the problem is every single bag that comes out is a black rolling bag, right? So how do you know which black rolling bag is yours? By the tag on it? Yeah, you've got tags on it, right? You've got a big pink bow or you've got a big One Direction sticker on it or whatever it is. You have things on it that allow you to identify it as you, as yours, right? So one of the things that we can have is we can have those tags on the outer surface as well. So they can act as tags and they can act as that sugar coat, that glycocalyx to help to hold it in place. And if we have protein, uh, pardon me, if we have carbohydrates, if we have lipids, then as is already mentioned, we can have proteins as well. And what color should we use for proteins? Let's use purple. We can have proteins uh, associated with the plasma membrane as well. Now, there can be a couple types. So let's, do, well, that's not supposed to be orange. Undo that. Do this. 
Go back to there. Let's make a couple more of these. So, Professor, um, yes. is it the carbohydrates alone that play a role as the identifying markers? No. Um, they can, some of them can be, but there are others that can be proteins as well. So, so it is not just the job of the carbohydrates to be uh, identifiers. Uh, some okay. identifiers are going to become a harbor, carbohydrates. Some identifiers are going to be proteins. Okay. All right. So, perfect. Nope, no. All righty, so let's talk. Proteins. With proteins, there are basically two main types uh, that we are going to find associated with the plasma membrane. The first one are what we could call integral. All right, that doesn't know that looks right. Integral. I can't, I can't figure out how to spell it. None of these look right. Integral. I don't know. Whatever. Membrane proteins. These are ones that are embedded within the plasma membrane. They can be embedded in either one layer or at uh, one layer or go through both layers of the plasma membrane. If it goes through both layers, we would also call it a transmembrane protein. So both of these are types of proteins uh, that are attached to, directly attached to the plasma membrane, either by going through both layers or just embedded in one layer. Again, these are more common, the uh, one layer on the inside but it is possible to have a one that is embedded on the outside and one of those protein tags we talked about would be a perfect example of one of those things. Again, that would be a tag uh, that would help us to identify this as a cell that is us. The second type of protein is what is called a peripheral membrane protein. Peripheral membrane proteins are associated with the plasma membrane, but not attached to it. So they're gonna be in close proximity. Sometimes they will actually be attached to, uh, uh, to integral membrane proteins, but they are associated with it, but not actually attached to it. Uh, these could be enzymes, these could be uh, energy molecules, other things along those lines that we could find associated with that as well. And as we talked about, proteins are incredibly diverse in their structure, so they're going to be incredibly diverse in their function. Some could be enzymes that are embedded in there. We could have identifiers like we talked about. Uh, that we talked about. Uh, they can be uh, linkers that are going to help to connect the cell to another cell. They can be receptors where a hormone, for instance, you could get some kind of hormone signal uh, that comes in and binds to it and affects some change on the inside. And the other thing they can be, and I'll cheat by making this one hollow, They can be uh, either transporters or channels, things that allow molecules to get either into or out of the cell. Now, obviously, if they're going to allow things to get into or out of the cell, they must be a transmembrane protein. Excuse me, Professor. Yep. So for the Sorry if I'm mistaken, but per peri peripheral? 
Yeah, membrane proteins. So they're all they they can only be transporters or channels. No, a peripheral one is on the inside. Those can be things like energy molecules or um, or they could be enzymes. They could be a lot of different things. Okay. The ones uh, the ones that are transporters, the ones that are channels or transporters, the ones that let things either into or outside of the cell must be an integral membrane protein. It must be embedded, not just, in, and really it must be a transmembrane protein. It has to go all the way through the plasma membrane to let things in or out. Uh, thank you. Okay. Now, again, I've done a truly amazing job of drawing this, but let's look at the pretty picture from your textbook, and this will make hopefully a little bit more sense. So again, as we talked about, we have membrane lipids, primarily our phospholipids and our cholesterol. Phospholipids form the plasma membrane, have that fluid mosaic that allows them to move around, and cholesterol, which helps to stabilize that plasma membrane. We have carbohydrates like the galactocalyx that we talked about, that sugar coat that is gonna help it to attach to and, uh, and um, and yes, peripheral membranes are considered, all of these things are considered part of the plasma membrane. Absolutely, all these things are. So like I said, when we draw a single circle as a cell, there's so much more to it than just that single circle. All of these things are considered part of the plasma membrane. Great question. Uh, we have integral, oh, there you go, that's why I spelled it wrong. Integral and peripheral membrane proteins. Right, integrals are the ones that are passing uh, into one or two layers of the phospholipids and peripheral are associated with them, mostly on the inside, but they can actually be on the outside as well. And like we said, they can function as channels, which are pores or transporters, which are movers, as well as linkers and receptors and all sorts of other things as well. Now again, here's the list of all the pretty words here is the pretty picture from your textbook that shows us all of these things. Here we go. So notice here we have, and let's switch to my highlighter, our phospholipids, the primary structure. And again, we see that bilayer, right? Heads out, tails in of that orientation of them. Notice here now more clearly, we see these nice yellow four uh, carbon ring cholesterols embedded within the plasma tails of the phospholipids so that, uh, you know, that they're uh, hydrophobic as well, providing more stability. Here in green, we have those carbohydrates uh, that are out here on the surface forming that glycocalyx, that sugar coat that is going to help to hold it in place. Here we have two examples of some integral membrane proteins. Notice one is just embedded in one phospholipid layer while the other goes through two. And notice too, this one has a hole right down the center. So this means this is gonna be one of those transmembrane proteins that allows passage into or out of the cell. But notice also we have some proteins both on the inside and on the outside and these linear ones as well. These are associated with the plasma membrane, but not actually attached to one of the layers. So these are our peripheral membrane proteins. So when we draw that single line for the outside of the cell, we can see there's a whole lot of stuff going on. And the reason we need this whole lot of stuff going on is because, like I said, we want this to be an important barrier to help to separate the cell from the outside world but it, we don't want it to be an impenetrable barrier. We want the cell to be able to interact with its environment. We want the plasma membrane to be able to interact with what's inside of it. And we do want to allow some things in and out of the cells. What we want is our cell to be selectively permeable, All right? Here in, um, Sacramento today, the temperature is going to be relatively nice, only getting up to about 79 degrees. Right? It's not going to reach 1,000 like it often does during the summer. So this is a perfect day for you to open your front door. Now, you don't truly want your front door open, right? I mean, yes, if you opened your front door, the breeze would be able to get in. Maybe you'd be able to smell the pie that your neighbor's baking. 
but your neighbor's dog could also get inside. All sorts of bugs could get inside. Your pet ferret could get out, right? We have all these issues with just having your front door wide open. So what do you do instead? You have a screen door. That screen door lets the sounds of the birds, the breeze, the smell of your neighbor's pie in, right? But the dog doesn't get in, the ferret doesn't get out, right? It limits what's able to get out. It is selectively permeable, right? Some things can get in and out and some things can't. And that's what we want our plasma membrane to be. We want it to be a barrier, but we want it to be a functional barrier. And so by having all this hunk and jug and stuff in it, we will be able to do that. Um, on the exam, yes. Would I use this kind of picture? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, could I show you this type of picture and ask you to identify the things on this? Absolutely. Yep, exactly. That's a great essay. Uh, pardon me, essay. A great type of lab question. Absolutely. All right. And again, it won't necessarily even be this one too. Any, like I said, any appropriate image I would use if it showed it. But yeah, any any picture in your textbook or something like that is definitely fair game on an exam. All right, so there's the pretty picture of that. As I mentioned, we want this selective permeability. So let's be specific. What are some of the things that can get in through our plasma membrane? And again, in this case, we want to just let things straight through. Mm -hmm. Yes, as we know, there's going to be proteins that are going to let things through and things like that. But if I'm just talking about that phospholipid barrier, so let's draw a little bit of it again right here. One. Two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Excellent. Now, when I talk about this being selectively permeable, I mean like what kind of things can just get through in between from one side of the other without any help? What type of things is our plasma membrane selectively permeable to? Salt water? Well, so again, let's be careful. So when we talk about salt water, what we're really talking about is sodium and cl sodium chloride, right? Right. And we also know that sodium chloride, when uh, sodium and chloride, when salt is put into water, it ionizes, becoming charged sodium and charged chloride. Things that have a charge are polar. Oops, yeah. And do you think polar things are gonna be able to easily pass through these, fa these uh, fatty acid tails to be able to get in and out without any assistance? No. No, without assist assistance. Yeah. You're absolutely correct. Sodium and chloride do need to get into and out of the cell, but they need help. They can't do it by themselves because Sodium they're polar. potassium pump. Right, well, that's one way that we could do it, absolutely. That helps with the potassium, and but there are other types of channels as well. So the, the water part, of, I mean, the polar part of it, no. So that won't. However, let's come back to water. I do want to talk about water. The water part of that, we will definitely come back to. So let's come back to that one for a second. What else then? If polar things can't, then what kind of things do you think can? Non-polar. Non-polar things. Right. So definitely things that are nonpolar uh, can easily pass in and out. Uh, what else, what might another criteria be? Well, give me an example of a nonpolar thing you think could pass through the plasma membrane without any help at all. How about oxygen? Mm. Oxygen is nonpolar. What else does, what else, what is another characteristic of oxygen? Well, how about small? Things that are small are going to be able to pass through. Things that are nonpolar are going to be able to pass through. And there's one other criteria, right? These fat, these fatty acids are nonpolar lipids. We know lipids don't like water, but what, what do lipids like? Other lipids. Other lipids. Other lipids. Excellent. There you go. So that's really it. The things that can pass through the plasma membrane without any help at all are things that are nonpolar, things that are small, or things that are lipid based. Those things can get through without any help. So things like water. Uh, pardon me, things like sodium and chloride, those are things that are going to need help. 
but that brings us back to water. Water is definitely small. It meets that criteria. That checks that off. But is water nonpolar? No. It's no, polar. water is definitely polar, right? That's part of what gives water its magical characteristics, right? It has surface tension to them. So when you hit it from the high dive doing that belly flop, it hurts like heck because that surface tension on it right? That uh, polarity of it is what causes it to expand when it freezes, whereas everything else gets smaller when it, get, when it becomes a solid, right? So it definitely is not is polar, so it doesn't meet that, and it's definitely not lipid-based either. So does that mean that water has no ability to be able to pass through the plasma membrane by itself? Well, it turns out it can, right? It actually is able to get through. We actually have a fancy name for that. Anyone know the fancy name of water just passing through the plasma membrane without any help? Osmosis. There you go. So clearly we have a name for the ability of it to be able to pass through, but it doesn't seem to meet the criteria. So it does seem a little wonky the way that water may be able to do that. And in fact, we don't fully understand how water is able to get through. There are some theories and the most recent theory appears to have go back to that fluid mosaic that we talked about. There is a whole lot of water outside of the cell. There is a whole lot of water inside of the cell. So there's huge pressures on water to want to move one way or another. And as we talked about, these lipids are a fluid mosaic where they will change positions. And it is believed that what happens is as these change positions, little gaps open up in between the phospholipids and they believe that water is basically able to sneak through those cracks as the phospholipids are moving. So as the phospholipids are moving, water is able to sneak in through the cracks and that is how it's able to get inside and outside of the cell without help. Now, there are also proteins that can help water to get in and out. Uh, what, what we call aquaporins. So let's draw a protein. So there are some proteins called aquaporins uh, that will allow water into and out of the cell more easily. But as it turns out, water does have an ability to sneak its way into the cell whether we want it to or not. Uh, so if the power of the water is strong enough, then it can get in there and influence it and affect changes. All right, perfect. So again, as we've talked about, things that are small, things that are nonpolar, things that are lipid-based, those are all things that can get through without any help. And that ability to get through without any help, we call simple diffusion, all right? Because it doesn't require any assistance at all. It just simply diffuses across the plasma membrane one way or another. Water, as we know, can simply diffuse, although we do give a fancy name to that simple diffusion of water, osmosis. But osmosis really is just the simple diffusion of water. Again, osmosis is thought of as this mystical, magical, uh, um, process, but really it's just the simple diffusion of water. So it's nice once we set up these rules for simple diffusion, it's nice to know that water follows those rules as well. But for other things, sodium, uh, chloride, like we talked about, larger components, things like that, then we need other ways to get in. One of those is going to be those integral, and again, as we talked about, they have to be specifically transmembrane proteins. And those transmembrane proteins that go through both layers uh, will allow them to go through. And as I mentioned, there are two different types, channels and transporters. Why do you think there's two different types? What do you think the difference between these two different types are? Maybe the size of the particle? Size could definitely be one of the factors that could influence it. What could be another factor that influences it? Uh, if it's polar or, or not, is that possible? 
true. Uh, that could be one thing that can influence it. The direction is another great example of things that can, can, that can affect it. Those are all things that absolutely are going to influence and affect the movement of our molecules. However, when we're talking about defining the difference between channels and transporters, what we're really talking about is the use of energy. Channels do not use energy to allow things to move. They're basically just doorways, whereas a transporter actually uses energy. So one of the big important factors that we have to think about when we're moving things into and out of the cell is whether or not we're using energy and why we would we use that energy and how we would use that energy. All right. So that's one of the major concepts we're going to be talking about is this use of energy for the movement of substances into and out of the cell. Of course, for really large things, as we already talked about, we're going to use vesicular transport, right? Remember, as we talked about, if we want to get something big out of the cell, we can put it in a vesicle, bring it to the plasma membrane, and release it. And what did we call that process again? What's that process? We put something in a vesicle, bring it to the plasma membrane, and expel it. Come on, I know yesterday was a long lecture, but you guys kind of retained some of the information. Exo. Exocyto or something? Or there not? you go, exocytosis. Okay. Conversely, we can attach something to the outside of the cell, wrap the plasma membrane around it, and bring it in in a vesicle. And what would we call that? Endo. There you go endocytosis. So there you go. When we talk about vesicular transport, bringing things in with a vesicle or out with a vesicle, we're talking about exocytosis and endocytosis. All right. Excellent. Now, uh, move this down here. Actually, I'll leave this up here. Perfect. Now, before we even start talking about movement across a membrane, we can just talk simply about diffusion, right? Weekend's coming up, so one of the things you're gonna wanna do for this weekend is to have a nice big pitcher of Kool-Aid in the uh, refrigerator because it's gonna be hot this weekend. Okay, it's not really gonna be hot this weekend, and you typically don't use cubes of Kool-Aid, but let's pretend we were making a pitcher of Kool-Aid anyway. We have a pitcher of Kool-Aid, here is our pitcher, here is our water level at the top, and we are gonna take our packet of Kool-Aid and we are going to drop all of the crystals of Kool-Aid into that pitcher. When we do that, do the crystals of Kool-Aid just cluster together in a clump in the corner of the pitcher, all scared and shivering, afraid to go anywhere or do anything? No. Of course not. If you let it sit and go, then much like those, uh, much like those uh, kindergartners we talked about, they are going to start spreading themselves out in space. So they are going to slowly start moving. When they move, they are moving randomly. One of the things, to, important things to remember, is they move randomly based on their kinetic energy. Right? But because there's more of them clustered together here, then what happens is these are going to spread out, basically moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. Until what happens? Until they evenly spread out? Exactly. Until the crystals are evenly spread out throughout the entire pitcher. And again, this does not require any work from us. What do we call that point once it is all equally distributed throughout the pitcher? Equilibrium. It is called equilibrium. And I'm going to cheat now and erase this so I have some room to play with. Hold on, let's 
bring that down to there. Perfect. Equilibrium. Excellent. So the goal is to reach equilibrium. However, what does equilibrium really mean? Is it really like what I've drawn in this picture where each one of these molecules finds its location and just statically stays right there? Is that what happens? No. No, there is constant movement. When we reach equilibrium, equilibrium means that things, it doesn't mean that things don't move anymore. What equilibrium actually means is that there is no net change. That is what equilibrium means. What equilibrium means is that for every molecule that goes up, oops, need to change back colors again. For every molecule that goes up, another one goes down. For every one that goes left, another one goes right. If you think about it, if you stood there for a year staring at a pitcher of Kool-Aid, would there ever be a point of time where suddenly a clear space opened up in the center of it because all the crystals moved out of that space? No. No. Right. Once it reaches equilibrium, it doesn't mean that the molecules don't stop moving. It just means that there's no net change. Every time one goes left, another one goes right. Every time one goes up, another one goes down. Okay, there's still very dynamic, still a lot of movement, but there is no net change. So there is always like a chain reaction to each movement. Well, it isn't so much a change reaction. It's just these things are all moving randomly, but they're so evenly disputed that at, uh, distribute, distributed that as things are moving randomly, there is no net change. Oh. At first, there is much more here than there is in the rest of the area. So while they're moving randomly, there's more outward movement from the high concentration to the low concentration. But once the concentration becomes equal everywhere, then there is no net change. There's still lots of dynamic movement, but there is no net change. Okay? So we comfortable with that idea? Yeah. So then what I want to know is what factors uh, influence the rate of diffusion. Temperature. Excellent. Perfect. I love it. Absolutely correct. One of the major factors, because we're dealing with kinetic energy, is temperature. If temperature goes up, kinetic energy goes up faster, and so things will distribute more rapidly. So it would reach, uh, a diff it would reach equilibrium more quickly, whereas temperature goes down, then it would slow the rate of diffusion down. What's another factor? Size. Size, absolutely. What diffuses quicker, small things or big things? Small. Small things, oh, small things move. What else? Uh, speed. No. I'm sorry? The speed of, no. Well, you're right, but speed really in this case is going to be associated with temperature. So temperature is going to be what affects it. Is it volume? Uh... I like where you're going with volume, but let's 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 put an asterisk by that and see if we can come up with a better term. So instead of volume, let's think of it this way. I like I like where you're thinking of volume. So let's change our picture a little bit. Let's say I have two beakers. All right. And I'm going to make these really simple beakers. They both have water in them. And so that I can get a starting point, both of them are going to have, uh, let's change the color of this, a sheet of plastic, like a rubber diaphragm down the center, separating one side from the other. What I'm gonna do on this side is I'm gonna put, make it 75% Kool-Aid. This one over here, I'm gonna make 50% Kool-Aid. All right, I am then going to take a screwdriver and with that screwdriver, I'm going to poke holes in my membrane. When I do that, in which of these two beakers do we have faster movement, faster diffusion, up here in A or down here in B? So let a. me hear or see your answers, either write them or answer them. Do we see it more in A or B? 
Okay. A. Well, another A. I heard it's A. I see a B. Right. Well, I not a lot of answers. Not everybody answered here. Maybe those of you didn't answer either because you were confused, or maybe because you know I didn't give you all the information. I didn't tell you what was on the other side of this beaker. As it turns <laughs> out, on the other side of this beaker, on this side over here, oh, it is 70% Kool-Aid. And in this one over here, it is 10% Kool-Aid. Now that I've given you all the information, which beaker is going to have the faster diffusion, A or B? There you go. It's B. B yeah. So notice when you say volume, that's not necessarily an incorrect answer, but more specifically, what we're looking for, you've got the right idea. It's not just how much of something you have, but it is really the difference between the two environments. And the fancy word we use for that is concentration gradient. Okay. Concentration gradient is really the difference in the volume of the stuff you have from one location to the next. There is a lot of stuff over here, but there's also a lot of stuff over here. So this diffusion that would take place in this beaker would be much, much slower. Now saying, uh, saying the density, is that wrong? Uh, well, again, it's not density, volume, kind of mean, it all means the same thing, but really it's not just the absolute volume in one location. It's the differences in those volume. It's differences in those densities. It's the differences in those concentrations between the two environments. Okay. Right. And let's take it one step further. As we mentioned, this one here is going to have the faster diffusion and it's going to continue to diffuse until it reaches equilibrium. What would equilibrium be in this particular beaker down here? What would equilibrium be in beaker B? 30-30? Uh, yeah, exactly. 30% on this side and 30% on this side. Exactly. Right. And again, remember, at that point, it isn't that things stop moving. It's just now there is no net change. There is equal movement to the left and equal movement to the right. All right, so that is where it would reach equilibrium, where now there is no net change. Before there was more going to the right, now it would be equal when it reaches equilibrium. Excellent. So size, temperature, concentration gradient. Uh, what's another factor that could influence how quickly diffusion takes place? Is it the fill of the water or not? Uh, sure, the medium could affect it, but again, we, we don't necessarily have to change those types of factors. Well, here, let me give you another example. Let's, uh, again, oh, I like that surface area, perfect. Surface area is absolutely one of the factors that could affect it. Let's see if I could, it's the easiest way for me to do this. Let's see if I can get that out of the way, and that out of the way, and that out of the way. Uh, surface area, in this case, might mean, oh, heck, let's get rid of all this stuff. Perfect. Uh, notice if on one of these, I just poked one hole, and if on the other one, I poked 15 holes, the more space that something has to pass from one side to the other, the easier that transmission is going to be. So absolutely, surface area uh, for, uh, for the exchange to take place is definitely one of the key factors that could influence it. I can think of one more good one. And for this, I need to clear my boxes entirely. Oops, oh, didn't mean to do that. I want to get rid of just that and that and that. Ah. All right. This is so much more easy when I have a whiteboard. All right, excellent. So let's say I have two beakers and both of those beakers contain one liter of water. One is tall and narrow and the other is short and squat. Both of those are going to have the exact same 
uh, solubility would affect it as well, but again, solubility would also affect uh, the concentration gradient, how much you actually got into solution. So it would affect that as well. Time, the, uh, time, the longer you allow time, the more, uh, the more uh, diffusion will take place, but time isn't going to change it. Uh, altitude could as well, absolutely. Yep, these are all factors that would uh, affect how long these things take, absolutely. But what about this case? Both of these have a liter of water in them. If I put the same amount of Kool-Aid into both of them, are both of them going to reach equilibrium at the same time? They should, unless you put uh, maybe the Kool-Aid pieces of their, no, we said size already, so never mind. Yep. So it turns out they don't. Even though they both have a liter of a water in them, they don't reach equilibrium uh, at the same time. This second beaker would reach equilibrium faster than the first beaker. Why would this beaker reach equilibrium faster? What's the other? What's the There's other? more space for the molecules. There you go, exactly. Space is a good way of describing it, but really the other way to think of it is distance. Right? How far does it have to travel? Notice to reach equilibrium, these molecules have to travel much farther to reach equilibrium than these have to travel. So the fact that they have a shorter distance to travel makes it easier for them to reach equilibrium. Excellent, I think we got all the big ones. Let's, uh, let's cheat and look at the pretty pictures uh, from the text and see if we've got them all. Our concentration gradient, temperature, size, the distance, surface area. Perfect, we got them all. All right. Now, notice one last thing. When you actually make a pitcher of Kool-Aid, is that what you do? You pour the crystals into the pitcher and just sit there and wait patiently while they reach equilibrium? No, you stir it. You stir it, absolutely. You take your spoon and you put it in and stir it. However, if you take your spoon and stick it in there and, and stir it, you are adding energy to the system. And if you're adding energy to the system, are we doing diffusion? No. Diffusion is a passive process. And by passive process, what I mean by that is it does not use any energy other than the kinetic uh, energy of the molecule. So it is just the kinetic energy of the molecule that causes it to move. If we get a spoon in there and stir, we are adding energy to it. And then it's not a passive process. At that point, it's an active process. And diffusion is a passive process. All right. Again, this isn't a new concept. You may not have thought of it in these terms, but really uh, passive movement of things, this diffusion of things is a pretty basic concept, right? Basically what we have here with these passive, when we're dealing with diffusion, and we have that passive uh, movement, one of the ways we can do that is with a channel. And again, this is where I'm gonna have to work on my analogies uh, because typically when I'm talking about a channel, what I point to at this point is the doorway of the classroom. If you think about the door frame in the classroom or if you look around where you are now in the door frame of your room that you're in right now, <coughs> um, our doorway is basically just a hole in the wall, right? Your house doesn't have to use any energy to get you to move through that doorway. You and your driving force determine which way you wanna go, right? If you need to leave your bedroom to go to the kitchen to get something to eat, if you need to come from your kitchen into your bedroom so that you can go to bed, it is your driving force that allows you to go through that doorway. Now again, just because it's a passive channel doesn't mean that it doesn't have important qualities to it. It can be selective, right? You fit very easily through your doorway. An elephant wouldn't. You can get into the house from your garage through the garage door. 
right? And and not, I mean, through the door to your front, to your garage, but your car can't get from your garage into your house through that door. The doors can be locked. So sometimes you can go through and sometimes it can. So it can be selective. It can be gated where sometimes it's open and sometimes it's closed. It can be specific so that only sodium or something like that can pass through it. Again, they still can have some uh, specificity to them, but they're basically just holes in the wall that things can pass through. And which way they're gonna pass through them is going to be determined by the concentration gradient. Again, concentration gradient uses kinetic energy. The classic example of this is if you are at the bottom of the hill and I am at the top of the hill and I have a ball, that ball has a tremendous amount of potential energy in it because it's at the top of that hill. So when I let it go, it uses that energy to roll down the hill to you. And I did not have to do anything. All I had to do is let go. And the ball does all the work. Well, that's what happens with molecules. When things are at a high concentration on one side and a low concentration on the other, then they move down their concentration gradient. Now, once I roll the ball down to the bottom of the hill, if I want to get that ball back to the top of the hill, that's going to take energy. So if I want to get the ball to go in the opposite direction, the way it doesn't want to go up its concentration gradient, then that is going to require energy. And typically in those cases, it is going to require a special type of protein, not just a channel, but in that case, a transporter, right? And transporters use energy. And they use that energy typically to move substances against their concentration gradient. So if it's down their concentration gradient, that's the way they want to move. We don't have to use any energy for that. We can just open a hole and they will freely move down their concentration gradient. But if we want to get something to move against its concentration gradient, we're going to have to use energy. And that's going to require a special type of protein. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. This is a good place for our uh, first break. I show it being 9.07. Again, we don't have a ton left to go over, but it's still some pretty dense material. So let's take a good break. We'll take a 10 minute break or thereabouts, come back at 9.20 and we will restart. And at that point, I will start the recording. All right, any questions before we take our break? All right, I will see you in about 10 minutes. Let's go ahead and get started. Any questions before we dive back in? All right, so we are still talking about passive movement and using these channels. And as we mentioned then, uh, with the passive movement, uh, the driving force is the molecule itself. And as we mentioned, it was primarily the concentration gradient we were talking about. But as it turns out, uh, there is more than just the chemical gradient or the concentration gradient that affects and influences how something moves. Let's talk about a simple example like we've been talking about again with our fake cell, which is this beaker filled with water. And as we've talked about, we can then put a, a diaphragm down the center separating it. Now, as we talked about, if I put 75% Kool-Aid on this side of the beaker, and I put 15% Kool-Aid on this side of the beaker, and then I poked a bunch of holes in that diaphragm, Kool-Aid would move. And which direction would it move? Towards the 15. Excellent, it would move in this case, oops, there's my color. It would move 
from the left to the right, and it would continue to do so until it reached equilibrium. And what would equilibrium be again at this point? 40-40? No, uh, I'm sorry, 45. There you go, 45% on this side and 45% on this side. And again, at that point, we would be at equilibrium. And again, equilibrium means no oops, let's do that. net movement. There's still plenty of movement, but there's no net movement. So again, for every molecule that moves to the left, one moves to the right, and there is no net change. And it would happily be at that case, all right? We're comfortable with that idea. There's nothing new here. This is all stuff that we just finished talking about. But let's change the story a little bit. In this case, everything is the same. We have our diaphragm. We have our two sides of the beaker. But in this case now, this is 75% sodium chloride on this side. And this over here, is 15% sodium chloride. And so instead of Kool-Aid, instead of basically sugar, uh, we have sodium chloride on the two sides. And in this case, instead of just poking a hole in the plasma membrane, what we're gonna do instead is put a special channel in this plasma. And this special channel just lets sodium move. So this special channel is a sodium channel <clears throat> that would allow sodium to move, but won't allow chloride to move. Now, the simple question is, will any chloride change sides? Not your question. Will no. there be any change in chloride from one side to the other? No. Perfect. Will sodium move? <clears throat> yeah. Yep, yeah, sodium is definitely going to move. In which direction is our sodium going to move? Towards the right, towards the 15. Excellent. So sodium is definitely going to move. And sodium is going to keep moving until what happens? Reaches equilibrium. Right. But is equilibrium going to be when there's 45% sodium on this side and 45% sodium on this side? Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the obvious answer? If the, if the answer was yes, would I be wait wasting all the time to talk about this? No. So the answer is clearly no. It's not going to become equal on the two sides. And that's because, as we talked about earlier, something special happens with salt when you put it in water. When you put it in water, it ionizes and becomes sodium ions, which are positively charged, and chloride ions, which are negatively charged. Now, we are absolutely correct in that uh, the first thing that is going to happen is one of these sodiums is going to go from the left to the right. <laughs> but instead of being 75%, let's just make it simple numbers. Let's say there were 75 sodium chloride on this side, and there were 15 sodium chloride on this side. When one sodium chloride moves over, now there is only 74 of those on this side, but still 75 chlorides. 74 positive things, 75 negative things. Notice this side of the cell, this side of our beaker, I should say, just became a little negative. Notice now on this side, there is going to be now 16 sodium positive things, and now only 15 chloride negative things. Notice this side of the beaker is suddenly gonna become a little positive. All right, you guys with me so far? Yes. Excellent. Because again, if this doesn't make sense, it's just gonna get worse. So notice what's happened is when the sodium, because sodium is a charged particle, 
when it moved across the membrane, it changed the balance. Before, this had no charge because it had 15 positive and 15 negative. This had 75 positive, 75 negative. But this has now upset this because sodium can move and chloride can't. One side becomes more negative and one side becomes more positive. And as we know, positive things, do they like negative things or do they like positive things? When you're playing with magnets, is it easy to get the two positive pieces together or is it easier to get a positive and a negative to go together? Positive and a negative? Positive and negative. So what happens is this negative force on this side is going to attract positive stuff. like the sodium. This side over here that's positive is going to start to repel. Oops, repel. Positive stuff. This charge, basically what's happening here is our cell has a charge, or our beaker in this case, which is our pretend cell, has a charge, and that charge affects uh, ions. It affects other charged particles. This effect on the charged particles is what we call an electrical force. So when we talk about what influences affect something to move, like sodium, like chloride, like potassium, there isn't just one gradient, there are two gradients. There is the concentration gradient, and that concentration gradient we can call the chemical force. And we have an electrical gradient, or what we can call the electrical force. All right. Now let's take this out of the realm of our beaker and into the realm of the cell, something we are familiar with. So let's, uh, I want to keep this, but I want to erase all the rest of this. So I guess I- A uh, quick question. Yeah. Uh, is there, which one um, takes priority? Is it the concentration or the electric, uh, or it doesn't have that option? Well, we are going to see actually both are important. And we'll see that exactly when we look at a real cell. So we'll see that we can't just think of one, we actually have to consider both. But to do that, let's switch from our beaker to our cell. Here is our cell. As we talked about in the last class, we know there is an unequal distribution of ions both inside and outside of the cell. What were the four ions we talked about? The most common ones, the ones that are most important that we talked about. Give me the first ion we talked about. Sodium. Sodium, excellent. Where was there more calcium. sodium? I'm sorry? Yeah, okay, sure, absolutely. So, but let's start first with uh, sodium. Where is there more sodium, inside the cell or outside the cell? Outside. Excellent. So there is a high concentration of sodium, a charged ion, outside the cell and a low uh, concentration of sodium inside the cell. Excellent. All right, I heard someone say potassium. Where was there more potassium? Inside the cell. Excellent, so there is a high concentration of potassium, another charged particle uh, ion inside the cell. No, I want to do that, perfect. And so a low concentration of potassium outside the cell. Excellent. Chloride, perfect. Can't forget our anions. Where was there more chloride, inside the cell or outside the cell? Inside the cell. Nope. Remember, there's more chloride outside. High concentration, because remember, we're big bags of salt water, sodium chloride, high levels of chloride outside of the cell. Low level of chloride inside the cell. And what was the fourth one? Potassium. And now, no, we got potassium already. What's the one that makes calcium. cells things? Calcium, excellent. And where was the more yes. calcium? Outside. More calcium outside, excellent. 
high level of calcium outside. And as we talked about, because calcium makes cells do wonky things, there's a very low, low, low level of calcium inside the cell. Excellent. So again, no new information. This is stuff we had already talked about before. So we've got that down, excellent. But now we need to identify another characteristic. Um, Not only are the ion, individual ions individually you know, distributed inside and outside unequally, but overall, for all charged particles, there is an unequal distribution. And as it turns out, the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside. There are more positively charged things outside of the cell and more negatively charged things on the inside of the cell. What this does is it gives the cell what we call, the cell has a resting membrane potential. What this means is when the cell is not doing work, there is a membrane potential on the cell where the cell is more negative on the inside than the outside. And we can actually measure this with a voltmeter. If we put a voltmeter on here, what we will see is that the resting membrane potential of a cell is about negative 70 millivolts. So on average, the inside of the cell is much more negative than the outside of the cell. So when a cell is at rest, this is the condition of the cell. Low amount of sodium, low amount of chloride, low amount of calcium, high amount of potassium, and negative on the inside. Are we comfortable with that as a starting point? This is really the new piece of, only new piece of information we've added here. But because now we have a membrane potential, we can look at the forces that are on each one of these ions. Let's start first by talking about sodium. As we already know, sodium, there's a high level of sodium outside, a low level of sodium inside. So our concentration gradient, or what we'll abbreviate as our chemical force, does sodium wanna go inside the cell or does sodium wanna go outside the cell? Sodium wants to go in. In, so the chemical force is wanting to go inside, perfect. So if we grab a red arrow, we know that our chemical force is wanting to go in, All right? We've done this for the others as well, but let's keep going. What about the chemical force for potassium? Does it want to go in or does it want to go out? Out. Out. Outside, perfect. And let's draw the pretty arrow to remind us of that as well. What about calcium? What's the chemical force on calcium? Wants to go out. Out? Right, isn't there, uh, there's a high concentration outside. It wants to go in. There you go, inside, perfect. Draw the arrow for that. And what about chloride? That wants to go in. Yep, it wants to go inside as well, perfect. Excellent. So those are the chemical forces on each of these ions. But remember, there's also going to be an electrical force as well. So let's talk about the electrical force and we'll change colors. What haven't I used yet? Let's use green. There is going to be an electrical force on sodium as well. Sodium is a positively charged ion. The inside of the cell is negative. So based on that, does sodium want to go inside or does sodium want to go outside? Do positive things want to go where they're negative or do positive things want to go where they're positive? I don't know. Inside. Again, think of it in terms of magnets. Yeah. Do positive things like other positive things or do positive things like negative things? Pos opposites attract, right? Yeah. In this case, the electrical force, positive sodium, wants to come inside the cell where it's negative. 
So the electrical force for sodium is to go inside. So if we were to draw that in terms of an arrow. So negative is the ground and positive wants to go to the ground. No, uh, ground, because uh, no, in this case, it's, it's much more like, like magnets. Positive and negatives attract, right? If you have something that is neutral, a magnet's not going to want to stick to it, right? That magnet doesn't stick to the wood. Right? Positive and negatives want to, uh, so if you have two magnets, the two positive ends don't want to uh, repulse each other. The two negative ends repulse each other. But the positive and the negatives, those attract. So this is about charge in that way. And so positive and negative want to come together. So they're both trying to come together, not one going to one. True, that is correct. But remember, the inside of the cell is what is negative. The sodium is just a little molecule that's moving by itself. So it's the thing that can come in. Are there negative things that are inside that are going to want to come out? Sure. But they're not able to pass through the membrane the same way. So since the inside of the cell is negative, it is attracting it in. Okay. Okay? So notice, sodium really, really, really wants to get into the cell both its chemical force and its electrical force are coming in. So this is gonna be important as we move down the class because what's gonna happen is since sodium wants to come into the cell really, really badly, we can actually let that sodium come in and get it to do work for us. So a lot of the work we're gonna be able to do in the cell, we're gonna be able to use this strong driving force of sodium, if sodium really wants to get into the cell to be able to do work for us. Notice the same thing happens with calcium as well. Notice calcium is also a positively charged, and in fact, it is a double positive charged. So notice its electrical force is also going to be to come to the inside. So calcium also really, really, really wants to come into the cell. But remember, as we talked about, calcium makes cells do wonky things. And so since it makes cells do wonky things, we don't always want calcium coming into the cell. So even though calcium really wants to come inside just like sodium, we're much more careful about letting sodium and calcium inside because calcium triggers a lot of very special uh, 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 metabolic activities of the cell. But notice both really, really want to get into the cell. Huge, huge driving forces on those. Notice potassium and chloride are a little bit more complicated. Notice there's a lot of potassium that wants to go out, so its chemical force is going out. But what about the electrical force of potassium? For potassium, which way, just as so thinking of the electrical force, which way is potassium going to want to flow, in or out? In. Yeah, it's going to actually want to go inside. So notice for potassium, its electrical force is wanting it to go in, and its chemical force is wanting it to go out. Chloride's the same way. Notice its chemical force, high concentration to a low concentration is in, but chloride's a negative ion. So based on its electrical force, which way is its electrical force gonna wanna go? Is that negative thing gonna, gonna wanna go inside where it's negative, or is it gonna wanna go outside where it's positive? Outside. Outside, it's gonna wanna go outside. Exactly, so its electrical force is going out. So notice the driving forces on potassium and chloride are not going to be as strong as the driving forces on sodium and potassium. I mean sodium and chloride and calcium. Now, remember our goal in all of this is to reach equilibrium. Our goal is to reach equilibrium. And when we're dealing with charged particles, it's a little bit more complicated. To reach equilibrium, remember our goal is no net movement. In this case, where we reach no net movement is going to be when our electrical force is equal and opposite of the chemical force. Oops. So let's take potassium for an example. There are two driving forces on potassium that are opposite of each other. 
but when the cell is at rest, it turns out that the chemical force is greater than the electrical force. So if we opened a potassium channel, potassium would continue to leave the cell. But as it continued to leave the cell, as a positive ion left the cell, that would make the cell, the inside of the cell more negative. And the more and more negative the cell gets, the stronger and stronger the electrical force would get. Until eventually the inside got so negative that the forces would be equal. Let's use green. That the forces would be equal. At this point, for every potassium that leaves down the concentration gradient, one would come in the electrical force and potassium would be at equilibrium. So as we'll see, and this will be especially important when we get to the nervous system at the end of the class, these two forces, both the chemical force and the electrical force, play a role in determining which way an ion is going to flow. So the original question is which of these are stronger? For most of, well, for, notice for calcium and sodium, they're in the same direction, so it doesn't matter. But for both potassium and chloride, as it turns out for both of them, the chemical forces are larger than the electrical forces. And so if you open a potassium channel, potassium leaves. If you open a chloride channel, chloride comes in. So when the cell is at rest for potassium and chloride, the chemical force is the stronger force and determines which way it moves. But its goal is gonna be eventually to wanna reach equilibrium where the two would be equal and opposite. Because again, our goal is no net movement. Equilibrium is no net movement. All right? With me so far? It's about to get a tiny bit worse. So if this doesn't make sense, it's only gonna be worse. So let's do, so let's make sure this makes sense. All right. Our goal is to maintain equilibrium. So let's take this one step further. Notice sodium really wants to come inside and potassium really wants to leave. So let's change colors again. Let's go to purple and my arrow. So notice if one sodium came inside, that would give us one positive thing on the inside. And if one potassium left, that would give us one positive thing leaving the cell. Have we changed the cell at all? No. One positive thing came in, one positive thing left. So the cell wouldn't be any smarter. It would still be at negative 70 millivolts, have the same amount of positive things on the inside, same amount of negative things on the inside. The cell would be happy. And sodium and potassium would be a little bit happier because they'd be getting closer to their equilibrium. But that's the problem. If we keep letting sodium come in, it won't want to do work for us anymore. So the problem is sodium keeps sneaking into the cell and potassium keeps sneaking out. So we need a way to fix that. Once a sodium comes in, we need a way to kick that sodium back out. Once a potassium leaves, we need a way to bring that potassium back in. And as someone hinted at earlier, we have a special transporter that allows that to happen, what is called the sodium potassium ATPase. Again, ACE, remember, is an enzyme. This enzyme uses ATP. Or the other common name is the sodium potassium pump. Remember, if we're going to use energy, we typically have to move things against their concentration gradient. And that's what happens here. Let's cheat and make this really big. Sodium wants to come in. So if I'm going to kick it out, to kick it out, I have to use ATP. I have to break that phosphate off, releasing that energy, and that can then pump sodium out. I can also use that ATP to then bring potassium in. 
And it turns out this pump doesn't just move one sodium and one potassium. What this pump actually does is it kicks three sodium out of the cell. And does anybody know how much potassium it brings in? If it kicks three out, would it bring three in? You would think that, but it turns out it doesn't. It actually brings two potassium in. So notice it doesn't bring an equal amount of these things in and out. It that doesn't work there. Oh, I didn't write in, okay. So it kicks out three sodium and it brings two potassium in. Notice one more thing about that, right? Three positive things are kicked out, only two positive things are brought in. Remember one of the things we know about the cell is that the cell is negative on the inside. And this sodium potassium ATPase is one of the big things that helps to keep this cell negative. In fact, when a cell is at rest and not doing anything else, about 25% of the cell's ATP is being used just on these pumps, just to kick sodium out of the cell and bring potassium back in. So this plays a major role in helping to maintain uh, the resting conditions and allowing the cell to, and these concentration gradients, which allows the cell to do work. All right, I've drawn this all pretty on here. Let's, hold on, let me do this and let me do this. Let me do this one more time. I'm trying to save this image so that we can throw this on the, on the page like I did the uh, mitosis one. So I think that will work. All right, so I've saved that now. So let's go ahead and clear this and then we can actually look at the pretty pictures from your textbook and do the same thing. So again, notice here, they are emphasizing the, uh, the unequal distribution of ions, more potassium inside, more potassium outside. Um, we see more sodium outside, less sodium inside, and so on and so forth. So we have that chemical gradient that we talked about. But as we also talked about, we have an electrical gradient. The inside of the cell is more negative. The outside of the cell is more positive. And that gives us our electrical gradient. So there are going to be two forces that are going to influence how ions are going to want to move, their concentration gradient and their electrical gradient. And so together, not surprisingly, they form the electrochemical gradient, the driving force on our ions. All right. Oh, I thought I had a pretty picture for this. I guess. Oh, I, I'll show it to you later. All right. Now, we've talked about diffusion of ions and other molecules, but remember the other thing we have to talk about is the diffusion of water. If we set up that same beaker that we did before, and again, we put water in it, and again, we put a diaphragm across the center. And again, we put, we'll go back to glucose. We put 75% glucose on this side. And again, we put 15% glucose on this side. And as we talked about, I then take my screwdriver and poke a bunch of holes in this membrane Glucose is going to move. And which way does glucose move again? To the right or to the left? To the right or the 15. It's going to move to the right until it reaches equilibrium. And at what point does it reach equilibrium? At 45. All right. So it would be 45% on this side and 45% on this side. And again, at that point, it's not that there's no net movement, it's just, I mean, a no movement, it's just that there is no net movement. The movement would be, oops, not what I wanted to do. The movement would be equal in both directions. Again, no new information there, right? But let's change the story a little bit. 
In this case, instead of using a screwdriver to poke holes in our membrane, instead, what I'm going to do is put a special protein in my membrane. And that special protein, like we talked about, is an aquaporin. Remember the aquaporins, as we talked about, are special proteins that allow water to move. In this case, will water move in this beaker? Yes, to achieve homeostasis. Absolutely, right? Glucose wants to move, the glucose wants to move to the right, but it can't get through that aquaporin. Water will move to want to reach equilibrium. And so which way will water move? To Down the right so. or to the left? Right. right. I've heard both now. Which is it? Is it going to move to the left or is it going to move to the right? To the left. Excellent. Water moves to the left. Oh, no, I didn't want that. I want blue. Lower concentration to the higher concentration. True. That is one of the ways to think of it. And again, especially if you've taken a biology class, one of those rules that are beaten into your head in like a 300 and 400 class is that water follows salt. Or sometimes they say water follows stuff, right? Which is a fancy way of saying water moves to where there is more solutes, right? That's the big fancy term you learned in a biology class. And if that's what you learned in your biology class and that's been beaten into your head and you want to remember that, then that is perfect and that is fine and that is acceptable. However, I don't like special rules, right? Remember, as we've talked about, all osmosis is, is diffusion of water. And we know that diffusion in diffusion things move from a high concentration to a low concentration all right so let's come back to our beaker as i mentioned this side of my beaker is 75 percent glucose what the heck's the other side of, what's the other 25%? Water. Exactly. It is 25% water. This side over here is 15% glucose. So how much water is on this side? 85%. 85% water. So notice, if our rule is things move from a high concentration to a low concentration, then you can clearly see that water is going to move to the left, down its concentration gradient. The same way glucose wants to move down its concentration gradient, water wants to move down its concentration gradient as well. And it will of course do that till it reaches equilibrium. And in this case, equilibrium on each side would be what percent water? 50-50. No, oh, no, I'm sorry, 55. 55? 55. 55? Yep. Yep, 55% water on this side and 55% water, oops, water on that side. And again, at that point, there would still be movement, just no net movement. So again, not a new rule. Osmosis is just the diffusion of water. So again, if you've had beaten into your head, water follows stuff, water goes to salt, water goes to where there's more stuff, that's fine. If you want to think of it just in terms of its diffusion of water moving down its concentration gradient, that's fine too. But that's all osmosis is. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. Now, you can actually set up beakers that actually do this and show this. And in fact, your book does a nice job of describing this. Back in ancient times, this is what we meant by YouTube. YouTube was a U-shaped tube that had a special membrane in the center of it that had those aquaporins on it. Notice they put the same amount of water on both sides, but different amounts of glucose. Glucose is a large molecule, can't get through that small pore 
but water is tiny and it can. So again, there's more water on this side, there's more stuff on this side, whichever way you want to think of it, water is going to move to the right. And it's going to continue to move to the right until not the volumes are equal, but the concentrations are equal. Right? At this point where the concentrations uh, are equal, then it's reached equilibrium. Right? This is the one from your textbook that shows this. I like this picture too. This one's not from your textbook. But what I like about this one is it emphasizes the larger number of water molecules. This has more water molecules. This has fewer water molecules. Again, those tiny water molecules move until the concentrations are equal. Notice not the volume's not equal. The concentrations are equal. All right? And it'll reach equilibrium and it'll stay there forever. Unless you do something to change it, right? This movement of water is from a hydro, uh, uh, pardon me, is from the osmotic force. That osmotic force is moving the water, in this case, from the left to the right. Is there any way we could get the water to move back to the left? Yes. How? By adding uh, the substance, I forgot what it was. True. If we added more solutes to this side, we could draw it back that way, but we would still be using an osmotic force. Is there another way without adding anything to, any chemicals to this, that we could get the water to go back to the other side? By pressure? Exactly, and not just any pressure, but pressure on the water. If we put pressure on the water, that pressure on the water is what we call a hydrostatic force. And so the opposite of osmotic force is a hydrostatic force. That is the force of the water. If we push on the water, we could force it back to the other side. So osmotic force and hydrostatic forces are opposite pressures. All right. What does a uh, um, high uh, osmotic force mean water force? High osmotic force means that you have a lot of stuff in the water that influences the movement, right? This is actually a great lead into what we need to talk about next, right? So let's go to this here and talk about tonicity, right? Again, I know today is going to be a beautiful day, but let's say about three weeks from now when we get a typical Sacramento summer day of it being 110 degrees at noon. And even though it's 110 degrees at noon, you decide to go up and tar your roof and spend eight hours tarring your roof in 110 degree weather with that hot tar. And because you're all man, you can't take any water up there with you. What's going to happen to you? Dehydrate? Yeah, you're going to get dehydrated. Hopefully you don't die, because that could easily happen as well. But uh, you're definitely going to get dehydrated, and they're going to rush you to the hospital. And when they rush you to the hospital and you're dehydrated because you don't have any of that water in your body, do they take a big, huge needle, stick it in your arm, and just take some deionized water and squirt it inside of you to quickly rehydrate you? Is that what they use? Do they use dehydrated, wa uh, deionized water for that? Just 100% pure H2O? No. No, of course they not. Why not? Because it would explode your cells. Exactly. Right? Os these, these osmotic forces, how much stuff in, is in the cell in relation to its environment, is what we call tonicity. You are absolutely correct. If we have a beaker, and let's take it outside of the body and take it back into the beaker. If we had a beaker of water and it was just 100% deionized water, in that beaker and we took one of your cells and put that cell inside that water, right? While there's, and let's actually, I'm gonna move this, put this up here, 100% water. We know there's a lot of water inside of your cell, but is it 100% water? No. No, inside your cell is water and stuff, right? You have water and stuff inside of here. So that means inside your cell is going to be less than 100% water. And as we just learned, water likes to go to where there's more stuff. 
Water likes to go down its concentration gradient. So what's gonna happen is all this water is going to enter into your cell. Your cell is gonna swell. And as someone mentioned, that cell might actually even burst or lice. It can actually cause the cell to rupture or what we say the cell to lice and die as a result of that. And that would be a very, very bad thing, right? Conversely, maybe instead of tarring your roof because it's such a hot day, you decide to take your boat out onto the ocean and your boat capsizes. And now you are in that salt water of the ocean. Yes, there's always the chance you could get eaten by sharks, but most people who die from exposure to the ocean isn't because they got eaten by sharks, it's because what happens to them? Dehydration. Dehydration, exactly, right? They could either drink the salt water, which would be really, really bad for them, but even just being exposed to that water for a prolonged period of time can be really, really bad. The reason for this is salt water has a lots of stuff in it. More stuff in it, oh, I expect to spell stuff correctly, more stuff in it than the cell has. And so what happens in this case is that our water, there we go, goes to where there's more stuff, is drawn out of the cell, and the cell crumples or collapses. Uh, this is a common study, a test that is done with red blood cells, and this process of the cell crump crumpling and collapsing, we call crenation. All right. What was the other one? It was crenation, and then when it explodes, it's... Lysing, the cell lyses. Lysis. Right. If instead... Oops, didn't mean to do that. When you are trying to tar your roof and you get rushed to the hospital, instead of just using uh, deionized water, they use something like a lactated ringer or some type of solution of sodium chloride or something along those lines. Because what they're doing is they're giving you a solution that is water and stuff. And the stuff in this water is the same amount of stuff. Again, it's amount of stuff, it's counting. It doesn't have to be the same things. It's just a number. There are 10 things inside the cell. There need to be 10 things outside of the cell. When that happens, the tonicity in this case is the same. And again, there will be equal movement of water into and outside of the cell, and the cell will be happy in that environment. All right? And so you rehydrate the body without damaging the cells. All right? This is the concept of tonicity. We've done it with all the pretty pictures. Let's do it, I mean, with all my drawings, but let's do it with the pretty pictures and the pretty words. When a cell is in an isotonic solution, that means that there is the same amount of stuff inside the cell and outside the cell. And the cell is gonna be happy in that environment. If instead a cell is in a hypertonic solution, this is, means that there is more stuff or conversely less water outside of the cell. And as we talked about, if that occurs, then water is gonna be oops, drawn out of the cell. Oops, and I need to move that. And we can get crenation of the cell where the cell collapses. Lastly, if a cell is in a hypotonic solution, that means there is less stuff, or again, more water outside the cell. And if that is the case, then as we talked about, the cell will swell up and can even lice as a result of that. So yeah, when we talk about these differences in the osmolarity, when we talk about the tonicity of the environment, the tonicity of the environment is vitally important for our cells. 
this right here, again, there's that famous case that happened here in Sacramento. Don't we for a we, right? We had a woman doing a competition on a radio show where she had to drink a massive amount of water in a very short period of time and not urinate. She ended up adding too much water to her, to her environment, to her blood, to her interstitial fluid, and it became a hypotonic environment. And that caused her cells to swell, that caused organs to fail, that caused uh, death because she had upset the tonicity of her body. She had set up an imbalance and it ultimately led to her death. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Last thing we need to talk about for today. Um, we're doing really good on time. So, and, and we're gonna finish a little bit early. So I'll tell you what, this last bit again is a little bit more dense. So let's go ahead and take a quick 10 minute break. Uh, come back at 1020 and at 1020, we will do the last little bit that we need to cover. It won't take long, but I think, uh, usually I can tell when you guys stop responding as much, everybody's getting a little tired. It's been an exhausting week. So it's okay to take a little bit of an extra break. And we are gonna finish early because again, it's been a rough week and uh, uh, rather than jumping ahead, I think uh, you guys have done enough for the week. So let's go ahead and take one last break, come back at 1020, and then we will finish off the last little bit of information we have to do for today. All right, see you in 10 minutes. All righty, let's head into our home stretch. All right. The last little bit that we need to talk about, as we mentioned, uh, for the physiological processes is, is to talk about this concept of membrane transport. Uh, when we talk about membrane transport, there are two ways to transport things, and those are passively and actively. And of course, this is whether or not you use energy. And when we're talking about energy in the cell, what is it that we're really talking about? What is the energy that is used by the cell to move things? Kinetic? Is it kinetic? Well, remember, kinetic is what we're going to use for passive. So passive is, you are right, we are just relying on kinetic only. But if we are going to actively move something, then that requires the cell using ATP. Exactly. ATP is going to be the energy. So really the big difference between passive and active is that active uses ATP, and passive does not use ATP, All right? So it's really whether is the cell using energy or are we just relying on the molecule to do the work for us? So that's really what we're gonna talk about. So let's talk first about passive. Passive membrane transport, and let's go ahead and draw this. So here is our membrane. When we talk about passive membrane transport, there are a couple ways that we can think about it. I'm not sure how the best to describe this. Um, let's think in terms of three main types, three, four main types. Let's go that way. Uh, main types of passive transport. The first is what we have already just been talking about from the get-go, and that is just simple diffusion. Simple diffusion, as we've mentioned, is just the ability of a molecule to pass through the plasma membrane without any assistance at all. So basically, it's just able to go straight, straight through those phospholipid bilayers. As we talked about, these are things that are small. These are things that are nonpolar. Uh, these are things that are lipid-based. Right, those are the things that are able to pass through the plasma membrane without any help at all, and that is just simple diffusion. Now remember, the reason I hesitated as to whether there are three or four main types is because if we want to, we could also think of osmosis 
as a special type of passive membrane transport. But remember, as we also talked about, osmosis is just the simple diffusion of water. So you can either consider it simple diffusion or you can consider it its own process. You can think of it either of those two ways, whatever tickles your fancy, uh, feel free to do it that way. But both of those are things that pass through the phospholipid bilayer without any help on its own. All right, so now let's make a pretty little divider here on the screen. We can use our highlighter for this. There you go, excellent. So that's simple diffusion, that is our first one or yeah, yeah, simple diffusion and osmosis, which could be simple diffusion of water, either way that you wanna think of that. The other way things can get through the plasma membrane is by facilitated diffusion. Notice the key to this sentence here. It is still diffusion. Diffusion means passive. Diffusion means that we are just letting it use its chemical force or its an electrical force to move it where it wants to go. But facilitated means that it is helped. So what happens here is facilitated diffusion is where we use proteins to allow substances to move. Notice the key word there. We're allowing the substances to move. We are not using energy to move them. We are allowing the substances to move on their own. And we've already talked about some examples of this. Let's cheat and poke a couple holes. There's one, there's two, and there's a third. And I need to cheat and move that a little bit. Right now. Excellent. The easiest type of facilitated diffusion is with the use of channels. Channels uh, are, again, structures made of protein. And they have a hole in the middle. And that hole in the middle is called the pore. So often when they talk about channels, they talk about pores. It's the same thing. You have a donut, you have the hole in the center of the donut, the donut makes the hole, the hole is the center of the donut. It's all the same thing. So what we have here, and let's make a, a channel, grab a couple proteins. Now I'm just gonna put two to maintain the two dimensionality of this, but this is often made from six or eight proteins that form a circle. And basically they just form, like we've talked about, that door frame. That door frame basically is an opening in the wall. And that opening in the wall is things is where things can pass through them, in or out. And so again, if this was a sodium channel, sodium would come in. If it was a potassium channel, potassium would leave. All right, so basically it is just a hole in the um, wall that allows things to go in and out. Now remember, as we talked about, it can still be selective. So it, we can have sodium channels, we could have potassium channels. They can be gated. Remember that means that they can be opened or they can be closed, right? So we can still have some specificity to these things. They can be selective in what they allow in, they can be gated, but again, they basically are just holes in the wall that things pass through. All right, with me so far? The second type of structure that can allow facilitated diffusion is what is called a carrier. Now a carrier is also made of protein, because again, this is facilitated diffusion, but here the proteins change shape to allow the molecule in or out. However, the change in shape is not due to the use of ATP. The change in shape occurs because of the molecule. Now I know at first this may not make a lot of sense, but let me ask the question this way. 
How many people here have been to the Sacramento Zoo? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. A lot of you. Excellent. Right. Uh, again, when you go to the zoo, it's a pretty good zoo for what we have here. And when it is time to leave the zoo, how do you get out of the zoo? How do you get out of the Sacramento Zoo? Through the gate? Yeah, but what does the gate look like? It's like a revolving door. Exactly. It is this big, huge revolving door, right? There's all these uh, big, huge metal pipes in a big circular structure that has to be rotated to get out. Now, is the zoo using energy? Does it have that gate plugged into an outlet where it's using electricity to rotate that uh, that revolving gate for you so that you can just walk out? No. No. What has to happen is you have to walk up to it. You have to grab the bar. You have to push the bar so that you change the shape of it so that you can get out. And that is exactly what happens with a carrier. Now, I don't know how well I'm going to be able to draw this, but I, I have pretty pictures for all of these things uh, when we look at it on the... Uh, uh, from the pretty pictures from the book, but I'm going to cheat and try to draw this a little bit. And so what can happen with a carrier is typically a carrier is going to be a molecule, I mean a structure made of proteins that in this case is just open on one side. Now what happens is this has typically a binding site to it, and so what's going to happen is like a larger molecule, like a glucose, can come in, I don't want to use red. A glucose can come in and that glucose binds to the protein. When it binds to the protein, and here's that magical term we've used again, it undergoes a conformational change. All right? Remember, that's just a fancy way of saying that it changes its shape the energy of the glucose binding to it. So that glucose binds to it. And when that glucose binds to it, it causes the molecule to change its shape. And what happens is it rotates so that now it's open on the other side and it's closed at the top. So what happens is it undergoes that conformational change and it changes its shape. When it changes its shape to the inside, what then is able to happen is that our glucose is released from the molecule. And when it's released from the molecule, then what happens is our carrier goes back to its original shape. Look at the advantage of this. As we talked about, these channels are holes in the wall, right? So you have a hole in your wall that allows you to get inside on the front door. It allows you to get inside. But if you wanted to get an elephant inside your house, one of the ways you could do that is by having a huge hole in the side of your house. And then that elephant would easily be able to get inside. The problem is if you had a hole big enough for an elephant to get inside, what else would happen? Everything will get inside. A whole lot of other stuff would get inside as well, absolutely. So while these channels are really useful for small things, if they're too big, other stuff can get in and we don't want that. So what we can use here is with a carrier, we again, it's a passive process, does not use ATP. Again, I can't emphasize that enough. Your definition of passive, right, does not use ATP. Right? Passive does not use ATP. We're not using ATP here. Instead, it is the energy of the glucose that changes the shape of the carrier, allowing a larger molecule into the cell without letting other stuff in as well. All right. Questions on that? Yeah, I have a question. Um, for the last one, uh, the carrier is that um, you said it changes shape. Now, are you talking about changing shape just for the opening, open and close, uh, in and out, or does it change shape to match whatever it's grabbing? 
No, it changes shape as in the opening. So again, I've, I've done some simple drawings here. Let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook where it makes a little bit more sense. So let's take a look at some of these and talk about these again. We have simple diffusion, which we've already talked about. And again, osmosis can fall under there as well. And then we have our facilitated diffusion. And we've talked about the differences in channels and carriers, but let's look at the picture, pictures, all right? Our channels, as we've talked about, can be pass, they're passive, they're specific, they can be gated. Here we see an example. Here is a channel. We have a protein, a circular protein, with a pore in the middle, a hole in the middle, that pore. And in this case, it happens to be potassium. Notice there are two more proteins attached to this. Notice one is a globular protein, one is a long linear protein. They actually have a very technical name for these proteins. They're referred to as the ball and chain. And notice what happens is the ball of that ball and chain can wedge itself into the pore. Notice when it's in there, the pore is now closed, the channel is closed, and potassium can't flow through it anymore. So again, it's selected, and here we can see it's gated. It can be opened and it can be closed. Here is the example of a carrier. Notice again, it is made of proteins, but with the carrier, because these are gonna allow larger things like glucose into them, they're typically only open on one side, All right? When that glucose then comes in and binds with the protein, it's gonna cause this protein to change its shape. And when it changes its shape, notice what happens. The carrier closes at the top and now opens on the bottom. And that allows the glucose in. As soon as that glucose lets go, then it goes back to its original shape. Open at the top, closed at the bottom. And then a new glucose binds and it changes shape and that glucose comes in. And then it goes back to the original shape, back and forth, back and forth. This protein is changed, these proteins are changing shape to allow the molecule into the cell. But notice the cell is not using the energy to do this. It is the energy of the glucose that is changing its shape. That is why this is passive, right? When you go to the zoo, you use your energy to get out of the zoo. The zoo doesn't have it plugged into a wall where, you're where it's using its energy to spin that gate so that you can get out. Instead, you use your energy. It's passive. The molecule oops, uses its energy to change the shape. All right, this is still passive. No ATP is used in this process. Not sued. The ATP is not sued either, but it's also not used. All right. Questions on that? So those are our three, or again, depending on how you want to think of it, four passive pathways into a cell. Simple diffusion for molecules, simple diffusion of water or osmosis, channels, and carriers. Questions on that? All right, remember blank, blank stares mean that we totally understand it. If it's dead silent, then that tells me I totally understand that. So make the questions harder on the exam because we got this. We totally got this. No, no, yeah. I'm lost, but yeah. it's okay. We can... <laughs> All right, just wanna make sure you guys are still awake. All right, excellent. Any questions on our passive membrane transport mechanisms? All right, excellent. Then let's move and talk about active. Now, again, we've already done one of the keys to the definition. Passive does not use ATP. Active transport uses ATP, but I wanna change the definition, or not change, but add to the definition. Our definition of active transport is where we use special proteins, to move molecules and they are going to either directly or maybe I should emphasize that or indirectly 
use ATP. So in active transport, we can either directly use ATP or we can indirectly use ATP. Now, as we've mentioned, if we're gonna use ATP, then typically we are doing this to move an ion where it doesn't wanna go. They wanna go down their concentration gradients. So if we're using ATP, then typically it means we are going to be moving the substance against its concentration gradient. Right, so typically when we're using active transport, we are doing it to move things against their concentration gradient. All right, with me so far? Yeah. Now, notice we have two types of active transport where we directly use ATP and indirectly use ATP. So there are two main types of active transport. Two main types of active transport. Uh, they are primary active transport. And primary active transport is where you directly use ATP to move a molecule or molecules. And secondary active transport. Secondary active transport is where we're gonna indirectly use ATP to move molecules. All right, so far so good? Yeah. Excellent, so let's look at examples of these again. Let's go ahead and draw our membrane and start first with our primary active transport, or what are often referred to as pumps. Primary active transporters are often referred to as pumps. Right? What we typically have, and I'm gonna draw this one just rather than having all the different proteins, I'm just gonna draw it as a simple sugar, a simple uh, blah, blah, blah a simple circle, although I wanna change the color. Let's go back and we'll use red. Now, as I mentioned, the goal of this is to use ATP. So an ATP is going to bind to this molecule this molecule then is going to split the ATP. And when it splits that ATP, remember we get ADP, we get a phosphate that gets ripped off and it releases energy. Can you move that a little bit higher? I can see. Can you not see any of it? Or no. no. Can, all right, so let's do uh, there and there. How about now? Yep, good. Perfect. All righty. Excellent. So what happens is this splits the ATP into ADP and phosphate. It releases the energy. And when it does that, we're able to do work. In this case, for instance, that work may be to kick calcium out of the cell. We know cells, calcium makes cells do wonky things. So in this case, what we're going to want to do is use a pump to use ATP to kick calcium out, okay? We've also, as we talked about, the most common pump in the cells is that sodium potassium. ATPase, or again, what we call the sodium potassium pump. Again, it uses ATP, it splits the ATP. I won't write what it does again, because we've already got that, but it splits the ATP and it uses that energy to do work. What does it do to sodium? 
Does it bring sodium into the cell or does it kick sodium out of the cell? Out. Out, excellent, it kicks sodium out. And remind me again, how many sodium does it kick out? Three. Three. Perfect. Three sodium are kicked out of the cell. At what does it do to potassium? Brings it in. Brings it in. Excellent. How many? Two. Two. Excellent. So one ATP is used to move five molecules. Two potassium are brought in and three sodium are kicked out. Pretty good. All right. And that is our primary active transporters. Again, they can move more than one thing, but they can also just one move one thing. The key is that the ATP binds directly to it in that phosphate is ripped off and the energy changes the shape. Again, think of it in terms, instead of the zoo, think of it in terms of the mall. If you are on the floor at the mall and you need to get up to the top floor of the mall, you have two choices. You have the stairs and you have the escalator. If you take the stairs, you are using the energy for you to get up the stairs, and so that would be a passive process. However, if you jump on the escalator, the escalator is plugged into the wall, and the, the mall is using their energy to transport you up to the top floor. So they are using energy to move you where you need to go, and that would be a perfect example of a primary active transporter. All right, we comfortable with that? Yeah. Then let's talk about secondary active transporters, because secondary active transporters are gonna be a little bit trickier. So let's get rid of these things. And talk now instead about our secondary active transporters. Now, as we already know, porters, oops. as we already know from our definition above, secondary active transporters indirectly, and let's emphasize that, they indirectly use ATP. What this means is that ATP does not bind to the, the transporter. We're gonna use it in a different way. Secondary active transporters also have another name. They are also known as co-transporters. And the reason for this is what a secondary active transporter does is it uses the energy of one molecule to do work for us, to do work for the cell. All right, let's go ahead and draw our co-transporter here. The co-transporter will make blue. Now, Remember, one of the things that we talked about is that we know sodium really, 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 really wants to get into the cell. Remember, its chemical force wants it to come inside. Its electrical force wants it to come inside. It really wants to come inside. So what these co-transporters do is they say, okay, sodium, you can come inside but you have to do some work for us. Remember, sodium has that driving force, kind of like we talked about when I'm standing at the top of the hill with that ball. I can let that ball go and it will roll to you down at the bottom of the hill. Well, maybe I need to tell you a piece of information. One thing I could do is use my energy to yell it to you at the bottom of the stairs. Or the other thing I could do is I could write it on a piece of paper tape it to the ball, and then let the ball go. The ball does the work of rolling down the hill, coming to you, and brings you the message. 
Or the other truly classic example is has to do with water wheels, right? If you, back in ancient times, wanted to have a mill that ground flour, you had two choices, right? Uh, hold on, I see there's a chat. Well, we'll get to, again, why it's called a transporter in just a second, Madison. You're at right, right idea. We are using the energy of the sodium, but let me finish this analogy and then we'll finish explaining what this transporter does, okay? So, I have a mill, I want to grind flour. I have three choices. Choice one is I can take me, and because it's an ancient time, my 16 kids, and we could all get on there with sticks and we can move that big, huge grinding wheel around to grind the, flat, the, the, the wheat to get the flour that we need to sell, right? We're gonna get pretty exhausted to do that. Option two is I could buy horses or mules or oxen or something like that, connect those to the wheel and they could spin it around. Or the third thing I could do is I could build my mill on the side of a river. And what I do is I put a big water wheel in the river. And what happens is the water flows by in the river. And as it flows by in the river, it turns my wheel. And as it turns my wheel, I use the energy of that turning wheel to grind my mill. And that's exactly what's happening here. Sodium, you really, really, really want to come into the cell? Sure, come on in. But when you come in, do some work for me. When you come in, would you mind bringing a glucose in with you? So I'm able to use the energy of the sodium to bring something like a glucose or an amino acid into the cell as well, right? This is why it's called a co-transporter. These are co-transporters because two things are being transported. The sodium is coming in and the glucose is being brought along with it. I'm using the energy of the sodium to change the shape of the molecule to do work for me. In this case, because they're going in the same direction, we call this a symporter. Because both molecules move in the same direction. Well, clearly, if we have a name for this, that doesn't have to be always the case. Let's make another co-transporter. We'll make this one green. Again, sodium really, really, really wants to come into the cell. So we say, okay, sodium, you can come inside, but I'm going to use the energy of you coming inside to do some work for me. And in this case, let's say I'm going to use that to kick out a hydrogen ion something I don't want in the cell, or maybe a calcium or something like that that I don't want in the cell. In this case, this is what we call an antiporter. This is where the two molecules move in opposite directions. All right. We're almost through it. So far, so good? Um, professor, I have a question. Yeah. Um, for the sim porter, it's just one sodium and one glucose, correct? Correct, yes. It's or one amino acid or one whatever, yes. Okay. The antiporter, it's one sodium and one hydrogen ion or one calcium ion or something like that. So yes, it's typically a one-to-one -one ratio with these, uh, with these co-transporters. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, just one question also. Um, these are two different transporters, right? Like one these transporter two can't different, do... Yes. Uh, yeah, correct. You cannot have a molecule that is both a sim porter and an antiporter, right? These are two different, and that's why I use different colors. These are two different co-transporters. Notice they are both co-transporters. That's the fancy word for both of them, right? One type of co-trans, because co-transporter means they're moving two things right? This one moves both things in the same direction, so it's called a symporter. This one moves the things in opposite directions, so it's an antiporter. Oh, and I spelled antiporter wrong. Antiporter. 
all right? Because it moves them in opposite directions. But both are examples of co-transporters because they're moving two things. All right, you guys with me so far? And great questions, any others? Okay, so there's one more piece we need to add to this. Remember, this is supposed to be active transport, where we use ATP. And notice I didn't put ATP anywhere on these molecules. Because remember, these are secondary active transporters. They only indirectly use ATP. And here we'll see why, right? We talked about how sodium really wants to get into the cell. So let's talk about a really simple example. Let's say that there are 10 sodium outside the cell. And let's say that there are four sodium inside the cell. That's our starting point, okay? Now, what we do is we let one of the sodiums, so what color don't I use, haven't I used yet? Let's use brown for this. I use one sodium to come in to bring in a glucose. After I've done that, how many sodiums are outside the cell? Nine. And how many sodiums are inside the cell? Five. Five, excellent. So then I use a sodium to kick out a calcium. How many sodium are now outside the cell? 10. No, sodium came in, calcium went out. So how many sodium oh, are outside the cell? Eight. How many sodium are inside the cell? These are the easy questions, folks. One Six. sodium came in, eight outside, how many inside? Six, there you go, excellent. Now, again, sodium still wants to come inside, so I let another sodium come inside and it brings in an amino acid with it. And now how many sodium do I have outside? Seven, right? One. What's eight minus one? That's seven. seven. Excellent. <laughs> how many sodium do I have on the inside? Seven. 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 Notice, now I've got the same amount of sodium inside and outside. Is sodium going to want to come inside anymore? No. And if sodium doesn't want to come inside, can I keep using these co-transporters? No. 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 So now suddenly I can't do work anymore. So notice, every time a sodium comes in, if I want these channels to continue to do work, what I need to do is I need to kick that sodium out. And to kick that sodium out, I'm going to need a sodium pump. Every time a sodium comes into the cell, if I want this cell to continue to do work for me, I have to take that sodium and kick it out. So as soon as a sodium comes in, I have to ship it over here and kick it out. And if I'm going to use a pump to kick that sodium out, what's that pump going to need? If I'm going to move sodium away, it doesn't want to go. What do I need to use to get a sodium ATP. to go where it doesn't want to go? ATP. So notice here, I'm going to use ATP. This is why we say it indirectly uses ATP. Notice ATP is not binding to my co-transporters. But if I don't use ATP to kick out the sodium, then these transporters won't do the work that I need. Does that make sense? So this is why it is an indirect use of ATP. The ATP is not binding to the molecule itself, but if I don't use ATP to kick sodium out, these won't continue to do work for me. So that's why these are still considered active transporters. They're just secondary active transporters. So I got a question. Yes. So if it doesn't bind to the molecule, then how is it uh, being used? Oh, here? Yeah. Uh, basically what happens is that the molecule will have two binding sites. So again, when we look at the, the three-dimensional shape of the structure, and I'll just draw a really simple one here. Basically what happens is it would be similar to a carrier in that it would typically be opened at one side. And what happens is the sodium would bind in one location and the glucose would bind at another. And so it uses the energy of the sodium to change the shape of the molecule 
so that both things came in. And then when the sodium left, it would go back. Or what would happen is sodium would bind on one side and when it changed shape, it would kick out the other molecule. So it can work in both ways. And again, I have, I have some prettier pictures that kind of show these things now that I'm done drawing them. So let's uh, do this. I'm, I've been taking pictures of these. We'll see if they're worth saving. But uh, if we've looked at my drawings, let's look at the actual pretty pictures from the textbook to see how this works as well. So any questions on this before, we, before I erase this and we go to the pretty pictures of the textbook? All right, excellent. Then let's clear that and look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. So again, this is still a facilitated or a mediated transport because we are using proteins, right? Things are not sliding through the plasma membrane by itself, but again, it's active. And remember, now we have a true definition of active. Active transport means either directly or indirectly using ATP. And again, if we're using active transport, typically it is moving molecules against their concentration gradient. And like I said, the classic example of that is the most common uh, active transporter, primary active transporter in a cell, and that is that sodium potassium ATPase. But remember, active transporters can be primary that directly use ATP or secondary that indirectly use ATP. Here's a pretty picture of, oh, I thought I had, well, we did that. Okay, I do, well, again, these are just the definitions. We'll go through them again. Secondary active transporters are co-transporters. They indirectly use ATP to do the work for them. And there are two types, symporters, both molecules move in the same direction, antiporters, both molecules move in opposite directions. All right, here are the pretty pictures. Here is what are, and again, this is a little simplistic drawing, but this is a drawing of essentially how a sodium potassium ATPase works. Notice at rest, it is open on one side and closed at the other, and it's open to the inside. When it's open to the inside, that allows three sodium to bind to it. Then our ATP comes, Notice our molecule splits the ATP into ADP and phosphate and uses the energy of that phosphate. Remember, we call this process phosphorylation and it changes the shape. So now it's open at the top and closed at the bottom and our sodium is released. Once that sodium is released, it allows two potassium to come in and bind. And when the potassium comes in and binds, that releases the phosphate and it goes back to its original shape and the potassium enters into the cell. So notice one ATP kicks out three sodium, brings in two potassium. Here, in a little bit more simplistic, is our examples of our secondary active transporters. Again, sodium is the most common molecule used in our secondary active transporters because as we talked about, Sodium really, 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 really wants to come into the cell. So we can let sodium come in to kick out a calcium, or we can let sodium come in to kick out a hydrogen. These are our antiporters because they're moving the molecules in opposite directions. Or we can let a sodium come in and it can bring in a glucose. Or we can let a sodium come in and it can bring in an amino acid. Yes, Ron. Um, about how many transport sites are there usually on a given cell? You mean how many of these different types of channels are there? Um, not different types, just number of sites. Uh, that, 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 I mean, I'm not even sure that that could be counted. It's an astronomical really? amount. Yeah, the, or, the number. There, there, there is so many, and again, so many different types and so many different numbers of these. That, that it, and one of the other things, too, is they are dynamically changing as well. Remember, as we talked about, we can express or remove proteins from the surface. So we can uh -huh. add more channels or remove more channels. Uh, but, I mean... I'm just trying to get a sense of scale, I guess. Thousands upon thousands. I mean, there okay. are many, many of these along the surface of a single cell. That's crazy. Yep. Thank you. Yep. 
No, it's a great question. And again, it, it, it's an astronomical number. We're not talking about one or 10 or yeah, 20. Or yeah, yeah, figured. We're talking about thousands of thousands of these. Yeah. All right. And there you go. Just that simply, that is everything that we need to know for our membrane transport. And that should hopefully help you, help you to be successful with your labster membrane transport that you'll be working on as well. Uh, this week. I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding. So when you said that it's using it indirectly, uh, how is it using it indirectly? I, I just don't see it. Okay. So notice up here with our primary active transporter, the ATP actually binds to the molecule to change the shape of the molecule. Okay. So that is direct use of ATP. Okay. Okay. Now, in this case, notice these aren't, ATP is not binding to these. What we are doing is sodium wants to come in the cell. And since sodium wants to come in the cell, we are able to use the energy of the sodium coming into the cell to spin these proteins so that they can do work, either kicking other things out or bringing other things in. Right? And uh, how are they coming in? Are they coming in because of the uh, gradient? Because sodium's doing the work. It's again, it's like that water wheel. You put the water wheel on the side of a river and as water comes down the river, the water coming down the river spins the wheel and you're able to do use the work of that to run your mill or to pan for gold or for whatever it is. That water coming down the river is an energy. Sodium coming into the cell is an energy and we can use that energy to do work for us. Gotcha. Okay. The problem is that sodium has to be able to come in. If sodium doesn't want to come in anymore, you can't do work. If someone up river puts a dam on your river and now water is not coming down anymore, is your wheel going to turn? No. And you can't do work. And it's the same thing here. Sodium wants to come in because remember, there's a lot of sodium outside the cell. Sodium wants to come in because the inside of the cell is negative. But if a lot of sodium comes into the side of the cell, then that's going to make the inside of the cell more positive. If a lot of sodium comes in, it's going to it could potentially reach equilibrium. Huh? It could potentially reach equilibrium, and if the inside of the cell gets positive, if the inside of the if the uh, if sodium reaches equilibrium, is sodium going to want to come in anymore? <laughs> no. Yeah, apparently, someone agrees with you. No, they're not going to want to. They're not going to want to come in anymore. Exactly, they're not going to want to come in anymore. And so, it to get these to continue to do work, as soon as this sodium comes in. And then what we need to do, as soon as this sodium comes in, we have to find a way to kick it back out. Got you. So it's using some kind of force to, to do that, like a repelling exactly. force. And no, well, not just, no, you're not using a repelling force. What you're using is a pump, something that directly uses ATP to kick sodium out. No, no, I was talking about like the secondary one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. Okay, All got right. it. Thank you. Yep. Great questions. Any others? All right. And the good news is with that, that is everything that we needed to talk about for today. So we get to finish a little bit early. So that is very nice. So uh, you guys get a nice long two day weekend. Start working on and mastering this material. On Monday, we're going to finish off the uh, cell with the last little bit of the cell protein synthesis. I'm uh, going to have a practice exam, and then we will start talking about tissues. Finally move up to our third level in our hierarchy of building that foundation. Then we're going to rapidly go through tissues and dive right into our first organ system, which is going to be the integratory system. And then one week from Monday, we have our exam. So you guys got a busy weekend. Take good advantage of it. Study hard, work hard. Uh, I will be around enough to answer questions by email. I won't be around as much on Saturday, but I will be available on Sunday to answer any questions or have, have any que any problems that you guys have. Uh, but I will be able to, to help, and I'll try to I'll try to check it uh, on Saturday. It just won't be quite as regularly. Sunday I'll be around, so I'll be much more accessible. All right.
Um, any questions question. on any of that? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. So the chapters in the book that we're responsible for is, yeah. uh, I guess, just unit one, one through four? Uh, well, no. For this, for the first exam, uh, I'll double check. For the first exam, it's really the first five chapters, if you think about it. Okay. Because uh, chapter one is our orientation, regional terms, directional terms. Mm -hmm. Chapter two is chemistry, but remember for chemistry, you're only going to be responsible for the part that we talked about in class, the macromolecules. Okay. Remember, I so told I... you to look at the other stuff because you needed that for the chemistry quiz, but that was the prerequisite. That was the stuff coming into this. Mm -hmm. So, right. It, you know, in, unless we specifically talked about something, it's not going to be, you know, most of that chapter is, it, is mostly review and things you should have known anyway. So there isn't going to okay. be a ton on that in there. Uh, and then cells, tissues, and then uh, next week, the last two days, uh, we'll be doing the integratory system. All right. So, yeah, so really this for, and again, part of the problem of it is at summer school, as I mentioned, in the normal, in the normal semester, we have more time and this is actually divided up into two tests, All right? Once oh, we're done wow. with cells, that's the first test and then tissues and the integratory system are their own test. But unfortunately, because of the pace during the summer, uh, that uh, with these have to be combined into one test. So yes, yeah, again, as I mentioned, one of the challenges of summer school is you have less learning time because we have to pack the stuff together too much. So yes, you're taking what's typically on the first two tests and taking it together in one exam. And you had two weeks to study it. So it's gonna, it, it, like I said, it is a challenge, but, but I know it's something that you guys, if you put the time and effort, I know it's something that you can be successful. With. It's possible. All righty. All right, All right. thank you. Any other questions, guys? Um, I was hoping that you could help me connect uh, dot R2 real quick. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm trying to figure out the correlation between the sodium potassium pump and the SA node in the heart that is basically your pacemaker. OK. So I was hoping that you could connect those two dots for me. Um, I, I sort of can, but but what you have to realize is they really they don't connect, they're different. So uh, let's, uh, hmm, what's the simplest way to do this? So let's clear this. What you have to remember is that, let's talk about a typical cell first, all right? With a typical cell, as we talked about, the goal of that typical cell is to be at Equilibrium, all right? That is the goal of all cells. What a cell ideally wants to be at is what we call, quote unquote, at rest, right? And as we talked about, that resting membrane potential is when the cell is at negative 70 millivolts. Right. Now, when we say at rest, it really isn't truly at rest. As we've talked about, there is massive stuff going on. All sorts of things like sodium are coming in, all things like potassium are leaving. We have pumps that are moving things in and out. Calcium is being pumped out, chloride's leaking in. There's all this stuff going on in and out of it. But at rest, again, the key is there is no net change. So with that no net change, the amount of positive things coming in, the amount of negative things coming in, the amount of positive things leaving, the amount of negative things leaving are all equal. So there's okay. lots of movement, but no net change. That is the goal for most cells. Right. And as we've talked about, because there are a lot of leak channels that are constantly opening, that sodium potassium ATPase plays a big role in helping to maintain that at rest, to help to maintain that membrane potential. Okay. okay. So that is a normal, typical cell. Right. The problem with the cells, the, uh, the conductive cells of the heart, like the SA node, mm -hmm. and again, this is uh, just for everybody real quickly, this is more than you guys need to know for this point in this class. So this is merely just knowledge for knowledge's sake. The conductive cells of the heart do not have a resting membrane potential. They don't have a resting state. Their membrane potential is constantly changing. 
Uh, and again, the reason for that are some very special types of channels that they have on the surface of them that cause their membrane potential to constantly flux. So what happens is it comes up, it reaches a threshold, and then it fires an action potential. And that spreads along the heart and has the heart beat. It then dips down and comes back up again. And when it reaches that threshold, fires that action potential again. So these right. cells fire these action potentials on your own. You could actually rip one of these cells out of your body, put it in a Petri dish. And as long as you provided it with the oxygen and the nutrients it would need, it would on its own produce these little action potentials. That's what we call autorhythmic, right? It's able to self-excite itself, all right? And so the reason for that is some very special channels that allow it to do that. Now, if I rip that cell out of your body and put it in a Petri dish and we watched it, it would fire an action potential at a rate of about 100 per minute. Is your current resting heart rate while you're sitting there right now 100 beats per minute? Generally, it's a little bit lower. Yeah, yeah, hopefully much lower, right? Hopefully your resting heart rate's closer to 70, 72, 74, 78, something along those lines. I guess it depends on how much caffeine you have and how excited you are to be in my class. But, uh, but it's typically much lower. So while it doesn't have a resting membrane potential, we are able to do things to make it go faster or make it go slower. And one of the ways we can make it go faster and make it go slower is by allowing other ions in. More sodium comes in, the faster it's going to go more potassium leaves, the slower it's going to go and things along those lines. So pumps are still necessary to help to maintain ion concentrations in those SA node, but they're not maintain it the same way it does in a normal resting cell because those special cells of the heart are very, very special and they don't have a resting membrane potential. So it still helps them to maintain, but they're still fluctuating and they're still changing their rates. So they aren't quite directly related to the SA node the same way. They're not as, it's not that they're not as important, but their role is different in the SA node than it is in the, uh, in a normal cell because there is no resting membrane potential in your SA node. Okay, so the SA node is constantly firing off. It's constantly trying to set that current, uh, to keep it going and the more sodium that you put into it the faster it'll fire off and the more potassium you put into it the slower it will fire off uh close the more remember sodium wants to come in so is more sodium enters into the cell it will it excites faster and it'll beat faster remember potassium wants to leave so if right. you opened a potassium channel potassium would leave the cell and that would make the cell more negative so it would take it longer to reach that critical point, that threshold where it would fire. So if you opened a potassium channel, that would slow the heart rate down. Okay. So it's not so much of separating the two elements to make a spark, it's more giving it the energy and nutrients and it would do it on its own. Yes. And yeah, it's gonna do it on its own, but we wanna be able to modify it. While you're sitting here calmly in class, we want your heart beating closer to 70 beats per minute. When you're jogging around you know, a, a track, we want it to beat faster. So by using sodium and potassium, we can change the rate at which it fires so it fires faster or slower. It can be modified. Okay. I think uh, so that answers your questions. I think that answered my question. Perfect. There was another answer here on chat. So let me uh, address that. The lecture handouts are study guides for the exam. Absolutely. They are definitely, if you think about it again, it's the things that we focused on. It's the, the main concepts we've talked about. One of the things that you should easily be able to do in this class is at the end of the lecture, look at the lecture slides, listen to the lecture and be able to come up with a list of possible essay questions. I mean, if you think about the things we talked about today, right, the things we talked about today, the structure of the plasma membrane, we talked about diffusion and the factors that influence that, uh, we talked about um, uh, electrical and chemical gradients, we talked about osmosis, we talked about passive and active membrane transport. Those were all the big concepts we talked about today, and those are the things that are on the slides, and those are the things that are potential essay questions on the exam. Like I said, um, for the most part, the more time we spend on something, the more important that concept is. 
And so the more likely something like that is going to show up on the exam. Absolutely. So, so they are very good uh, study guides for that. But yes, you need, they are outlines. They're not all the information you are responsible for. So you use the lecture and the things that I've said, or you use your textbook. And that's the other thing too. One of the keys when people talk about how to study best for this class, uh, your textbook is a tremendous resource, but how you use that resource is really up to you. It isn't a romance novel. It doesn't have to be read from cover to cover, right? Some people need that. Some people need to read the entire chapter to see how all the pieces fit together so that the information makes sense for them. But you're not required to read the whole chapter. Other people, they read the whole chapter and they're overwhelmed by all that information. So instead, what I suggest for those people is to listen to the lecture first, watch the lecture first, take good notes during the lecture. Then, is if we're after like today, if for instance, that uh, secondary active transport was a concept that was confusing to you, then yes, go to your textbook just to the part where it talks about secondary active transport and read that part. And hopefully after experiencing it in the classroom and having the lecture and going through it, then reading it and hearing it in a different voice can help you to understand the information better that way as well. But yeah, the focus for the exams is absolutely gonna be the things we talk about in class, the things that are on the slides, because those are the things that are most important. And like I said, the more time we spend on things, the more important it is. Like I said, the one exception to that was the regional terms and directional terms. We maybe only spent 15 minutes talking about that, but like I said, it's hugely important and could easily be something like 20% of your lab exam. All right. Great questions. Any others? Yeah, uh, one more question. Um, I, I didn't really uh, understand or maybe I misunderstood. For, the, um, for chapter two, chemistry, you said we're going to be tested on only which parts of chapter two? Only the part we talked about in class. So again, definitely like they mentioned, use the lecture slides to look at the parts that are important in chapter two. We, uh, chapter two, chemistry, we only talked about the macromolecules. Those are the things that you're going to be held responsible for, right? The carbohydrates, uh, the lipids, the proteins, the nucleic acids, those things. All of the acid base, all that kind of stuff that we didn't talk about, that's not going to be on the exam. That's the stuff you were supposed to know coming into this class. Gotcha. Okay. So you should always use the lecture slides as your study guide for what to focus on for the exams, but that is especially true for chapter two. Because if you look at chapter two, there is a ton of stuff in chapter two, and we only talked about a very small part of it. So anytime you spend studying the other stuff in chapter two, you're wasting your time. Got it. Okay. All right. Great questions, as always. You guys are excellent that way. Any other questions? All right. Well, then at this point, I will end the recording. As always, you guys have a very safe and healthy weekend. Study hard, study well, uh, and I will see you bright and early Monday morning. All right. Take All right. care. You too. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye.